and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we proudly bring to you Mormonism Live! Shut up and sit down. Wow, that sounded incredible. And if only our faces were showing. There we what go. What a great audience. They were applauding even, even before our faces showed. I think there most of that go. was for you, Maven. <laughs> most of that applause was for you, I think. I am just happy that I got that to work this time. Um, I've been doing some testing and some practicing. And uh, yeah, and hopefully we can do phone calls at the end as well. So Maven has been working very, very hard to make this all look super professional, even better than it's ever looked before. So that when Bill gets back from vacation, we can give him the old heave ho. <laughs> no. We'll give him a surprise when he gets back. Oh man. Yeah. I don't know if it'd be a pleasant one or not, but I, I don't know. Did he say anything about last week's show? I didn't like in our normal chat, any comments or anything. <laughs> I can't remember. Uh, and that's terrible. I think he said something about it and it was positive. Okay. That's good. That's good. It was great. And, you know, and as long as we can stay away from like the cycles of the moon this week, I think we'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I still, I still need to look that up and see like what I was getting wrong or what I was so confused about. So, well, that's anyways. that's. Hey, by the way, before we go on with tonight's show, do you have an announcement about the T-shirt contest? I don't have an announcement. Just that it's still going. We've received some submissions already. Um, but we're going at least one more week, but I think we could maybe go another if we need to, but I, I think, yeah, I don't know. Maybe we should just make it a week. So if you, if you guys are going to do it, you got to do it this week, uh, send it in to, um, to bill at the email address that I will put up on the screen at some point. And, um, yeah, it's, it's what it's Mormon discussion podcasts with an S at gmail.com. I believe that's what it is. Is it Mormon discussion or Mormon discussions podcasts? It, I think it's Mormon discussions and podcasts, but I better double check because I uh, I still send things to the wrong email sometimes because it's like saved in there, you know? Yes, I Bill worked hard on that to make it as confusing as possible. I know, just super long. <laughs> you can't tell he's a former member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. There you go. Yeah. So yes, keep sending in your submissions and then, um, you know, once we get them in, we'll go ahead and put them up on the website and then we'll start uh, voting. So, Okay, fantastic. It sounds exciting. Almost as exciting as our guests that we have on for tonight's show. Yes. So let me go ahead and set this up, okay? Uh, there's a gentleman that I met last January when I was down in St. George giving a presentation and his name is Tyler. And he was in the audience and he came up afterward and there were several people who wanted to talk with me afterward, but Tyler was there. I think we spent at least an hour. It might've been closer to two hours talking there in that room before I was able to escape. I mean, no, it was all very exciting. He's very, very intelligent. No, Tyler's super intelligent and he's super charismatic too, which plays into this because he gave me a call. Oh, about a week ago and said, you'll never guess what happened to me last Sunday. And this is a week ago Sunday, right? I think it's the 18th. If I remember correctly, I know he will. But uh, he was at an airport in Los Angeles. And he was in the Delta Sky Club. Have you ever heard of that, Maven? Yes. Have, have you ever I, been into one? I've walked by them, um, but I've never been important enough to be able to get into one. That's not true, actually. I think I think a long time ago when I, I was still, I think I was able to use like a, de a military dependent card and, and get into one for, for some snacks after yeah. a really long, or, you know, for a long layover. Okay. Well, but you're kind of like me. These are the things I walk by and think, wow, I wish I could be important enough nice. to be able to go in there instead of hanging out here with all the, the hoi the polloi. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Which is where I, you know, I'm most comfortable, but, but uh, Tyler is sufficiently, whatever it takes to be in the Delta Sky Club. And that's where he was at LAX 
a week ago Sunday, and he ran into someone kind of unexpected. And let's bring Tyler on if we can. All righty. There he is. Hi, Tyler. How are you doing? All right. Yeah, doing good. Nice to see you guys. Well, it's great to have you on the show. So, so far, have I misrepresented anything terribly? Uh, yeah, um, that somehow you insinuated the importance of, of a person to go into the Delta Sky Club or something. I'm just, I, I get a membership because I'm Diamond Medallion, you know, so it's nothing special. Ooh. Although, I You're guess. You're really going to start special. showing off now, aren't you? <laughs> that means you fly a lot, right? Uh, well, I guess so, yeah. Yeah, compared to me, I think you do. So, um, but this was, was it September 18th? Yeah, September 18th, right, just last Sunday. Well, the Sunday. Day. And who was it you ran into at the Delta Sky Club at LAX? Uh, well, technically, I didn't run into anybody. I typically watch where I'm going. But I I was actually on a, a, an important uh, business call. And I'm going through, I'm going, I'm entering the Desert Sky Club and I'm, and I'm finding a place to sit down and I'm focused on where I'm going so I don't run into anybody on accident as well as, you know, on my call. And lo and behold, I see the man, Elder Bednar. And, and, I, and I'm on the phone and, I, and then they're asking me questions on the phone and I'm like, I, I'm not cognizant enough because I'm so enthralled in watching elder bednar I, I want to talk to him i have so many thoughts or questions i mean I, th this this man has been um, important to my life for so many years um you know i started my mission just sh shortly after uh he he was called as an apostle so when was that uh, well i started my mission in 2006 so i think he was called in 2005 or or, or so right right after he was president of bricks college but Anyway, needless to say, I told uh, the people on the call, I was like, hey, listen, I, I got to go. I, 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 someone I need to talk to. Um, and then, well, what I did is I, I didn't want to, you know, out of respect for Elder Bednar, I mean, he, he's, a, he's a very bus busy person and, and things, and I didn't want, you know, just to, you know, rush him and, and, and everything. Um, I, I don't like when people, you know, rush up to me or whatever or, or something, and, and I'm busy doing other things. Um, I mean, I'm happy to talk to people. I'm just, I'm just saying, I, I can understand what you know. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to. You want to be respectful, right? So I, I just watched a little bit, just observed, and and I, nobody was really coming up to him. No one really recognized um, who he was, or space, you know, gave him any special, I don't know, uh, adulation, right? But what makes sense because again, you're, if this is Sunday, so we should be in church, actually. Isn't he making pilots work on the Sabbath? You know, I was going to ask him that, you know, what about, you know, I, I was like, I feel so much better seeing you uh, here because I was, I was feeling pretty sad at myself that I had broken the Sabbath day or something, but. <laughs> <laughs> what say we break the Sabbath together? Right. <laughs> um, but anyway, when I, when I saw that nobody was really talking to him and, and he, and uh, I, I was for sure he was i wasn't sure but i the spirit told me or you know that he was probably going to salt lake and i was also um heading back so we had he had some time and he went and sat uh, down next to his wife and you know he, is he was, that his wife from yeah. the back of her head right yeah and is he going for a gun in this picture <laughs> you know that he does i think he's reaching for his cell phone I, maybe he's going for a water bottle in the picture does it not look like he's he's somehow <laughs> teaching the gospel uh it does. Related to soccer or something it does it's, it's like he's going to make some kind of profound analogy of a gospel principle to the game of soccer right which i'm sure he could do there oh absolutely keep your eye on the ball he's known for that so yeah. he's up there but, but uh, when you you took this picture right right Okay. And I know when I saw it, I was thinking he was addressing a congregation of some sort at some kind of event where he was the speaker. Yeah, no, he, you can see he, he was, I mean, he was, that's just like a, a, a happenstance photo. He was just saying something to the, to the general authority next to him, just as he was about to sit down. I think he was just grabbing his phone out of his pocket before he, he took a seat. Okay. And where did he end up sitting down? Is that in this picture? Uh, just just on, on to the, the uh, left of his wife, you know, right against the wall. Oh, OK. So this is something where he's not speaking. He just happens to be present. He's talking to this G.A. over here to his wife, Susan's right. Do you happen to know who that G.A. was? 
No, I, I unfortunately didn't even ask his name. Okay, someone was wondering if it was Brad Wilcox. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> oh my goodness. You know, now that you say that, I did see his face. I think it was. It very well could be. Okay, don't commit yourself to anything. No, I'm not but... committing myself. I'm just saying, I think we all know the fallibility of memory, this audience more than others. <laughs> yes, right. absolutely. But so he sits down over here. You happen to be present in the room. You've taken a photo of him, um, which ends up being at least some way of documenting that you actually were in the same room with him. And then what happens? What do you do to talk to Elder Bednar? Well, so, so I just watched him a little bit to make sure he's not too busy. You know, maybe he needs to, you know, check his emails or something. He pulled out his phone and started, you know, scrolling through TikTok. I'm no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, 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 just, he just looked at something and, and uh, it, it was clear he wasn't too busy. And so um, instead of going all the way to the front, you know, there wasn't really a good place. I, I actually approached him um, from behind. Um, so I, I'd be kneeling down. Kind of like he did to that little boy in that fireside. Oh my gosh! I, <laughs> well, so I I I went and, and knelt down so he he could just turn to the side and a very have a comfortable uh, conversation with me. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, are you kneeling? I was kneeling at his feet, but well, not his feet were over there, so I couldn't wash him or anything. Um, <laughs> this wouldn't be the first time. Try them. <laughs> Um, but, but it did make for a good atmosphere, uh, just, just so that we're in the corner, we're kind of secluded. There's not really anybody around us. Um, it, it, but, but, but because of the direction, it made it impossible to, uh, include, uh, his wife in the conversation, uh, j just the way that it was, but, but, it, but it was a good atmosphere though, to have a, a enjoyable conversation. Well, great. And I want to, oh, sorry, Maven. No, so so you were saying you you were positioned so that she could join in. No, sorry, so she could not. She would not be able to. It'd be awkward um, because I I was I was kneeling down facing him on on the uh, behind her chair. Oh, okay. Right. So so she would have had to really turn, you know. And anyway, she, and she, it's an awkward yeah. kind of chair thing. Okay. Yeah. All right. No, that's fine. I I I, I misunderstood and. I guess if she could have joined in, I would have been curious why she didn't, or if she just sat there listening, you know, just kind of looking at you guys the whole time, but I, maybe she was enjoying the game. Do you think Susan ever breaks into a conversation her husband's having with somebody else? Break in? No. But yeah. I feel like if it was done yeah. in a way where she was like, you know, kind of included, I guess, you know, I, I right. don't know. That, that is one thing I, I, feel bad about i feel is a little disrespectful the way that i uh, you know did not include her or engage her i guess i was just so enthralled with talking with um elder bednar at the time that I, I, I didn't try to turn my i wasn't trying to imply that you weren't but including her been, i just misunderstood that yeah, no, but but i, I, I thought you said that you did or like she was positioned so that you could talk to both of them uh, just because of what I know of your recollection, I didn't see that she had chimed in. So I would have thought that that was odd. So, yeah. So I wasn't trying to say anything about you. Not no, 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 I get that. No, I, but I'm saying I agree with you. It would have been interesting if, if the, if, if the view could have been, so I could have at least watched her facial expressions or seen maybe her, her, her reaction or something. And, and unfortunately I, I really don't know. And I don't even know if she was really paying attention to the conversation. I, I was, very much looking at um, into El that Elder Bednar. Okay, so we're going to go over a transcript. And you put together a transcript of your conversation, which I understand was around 40 minutes long you got in this private audience with Elder Bednar. Yeah, I was really happy about that. Um, you know, I have, I've had talked with other uh, apostles in the past, um, you know, President Hinckley, James E. Faust, um, more recently, Elder Gong, and it seems that you have about 20 seconds at best, and you can't really ask a question. And the one time I asked Elder Gong a question, um, you know, he, he quickly said, oh, you know, that is a really, really good question. And then he handed, it over, handed me over to uh, um, the, the other priesthood leader he was with, um, you know, so it didn't go very, very far. Um, so, so with Elder Bennar, I really wanted to um, have it be an enjoyable conversation so that I could, you know, maybe just talk more and, and get his thoughts and perspectives on things. And so um, I, I was able to 
I, basically, I, I, I brought up a number of uh, thoughts or considerations um, or critical uh, perspectives that one, one could call uh, about the church and, and would ask him his perspective or something. I'd often give my apologetic uh, response that I've either used or have heard um, and then kind of see if he'd, he'd uh, you know, if he would maybe add more to that or, you know, if he agreed with that or didn't agree with that. Um, and, and in this way, you know, I, I think we have to be somewhat careful in how we interpret everything he says, because I might have biased him by, I guess, uh, agreeing with everything that I said, because like I said, I'd give a kind of apologetic response and to see what he would say. So I'm kind of, you know, like as an attorney, we'd call that like, uh, you know, maybe begging the question or not beg or leading the question or priming him, for example, um, so something like this, but um, but, but it was a good conversation, and any time I felt any amount of maybe uh, discomfort or talked about an area that he maybe didn't know, like I felt or I could tell maybe he didn't really know so much about, I quickly moved on to a different subject because if you don't know the facts or the details, you really can't have a conversation wor worth anything. And so I quickly just would, would move the topic along, um, and I, I, I often would not press something further until the very end, which we, which we get to. Um, but I, I would just want to move the conversation to not make him feel uncomfortable or cut the conversation short or anything. <clears throat> and then as soon as I finished the conversation, immediately when I done the conversation, I wrote down as many uh, key points as I could. And then um, we, we got on the plane and I rehearsed it several times. My mind just, you know, try to really keep a good, fresh um, mind about it. And then when I got home, I rehearsed it um, to, to, to family and then uh, the next day I rehearsed it to two of my friends. And then um, the next day I rehearsed it again. And then finally Wednesday when I had time, finally, I, I spent um, the afternoon and I just wrote the transcript of basically the entire conversation. And, you know, I felt like Wilford Woodruff must have when he talked about how he would hear these sermons of Joseph Smith and he could write everything down word for word. And, and once it was written, then the memory was forgot or something. And, and, and so this transcript, I, I genuinely feel it is a very true representation of what Elder Bednar said. And it's a very good trans, uh, um, uh, it's not really a transcript. I guess we could maybe call it a translation or something. Right. <laughs> We're using transcript as, a, as the church uses translation. Yes. Um, but but I, I want to say ask in the in the chat, I think it was Marco, <laughs> if you, you were, um, you know, sure to be in a one party state. So so we want to make it very clear this was not a recording. So. Yeah, this is just my recollection of, of the conversation. And that's why I was trying to stress that I I rehearsed it several times. I wrote down notes immediately. And, and then the spirit came upon me and allowed me to recall in really good detail. A lot of what we see are, are direct quotes. I almost want to put direct quotes in things that I really felt comfortable with, but that's kind of going too far. And again, there's nothing in the transcript that is like egregious or out of character for Elder Bednar to say. In fact, uh, just so our audience knows, I've sent this to our state president, our bishop, many people in, in our ward, um, to, to different family, to friends, and, and many of them gone back to me and said, this is, has been very, uh, very powerful, very uh, faith promoting, very you know, spiritual. And they really appreciated that I, that I shared this with them. And it is, it is really cool. It was a cool experience. And, and I did feel some of those same fruits of the spirit, which, which we'll talk about. Um, but, but I also think there are some important things that he said that maybe give us some insight into how Elder, Elder, Elder Bednar sees things or reconciles things or what he's aware of or not aware of that might be helpful just to provide a little bit more insight in, into him as apostle. Okay. Well, let me go ahead and announce to the audience that uh, your name is Tyler. We're not going to be using your last name tonight. Tyler's coming on mainly to report as accurately as he can his recollection and his transcript of what the conversation was like with Elder Bednar. He has divided those up into different sections about different subjects that he talked with Elder Bednar. He'll be reading his own part. Yes, the part of Tyler will be played by Tyler in the conversation. And when it comes to Elder Bednar, either Maven or I will switch out playing Elder Bednar. And after each section, we're going to stop. And Maven and I are going to talk back and forth and make comments that we have. And you can throw in with anything you want to say. Because my understanding is you're, you're here mainly to report what it was that happened in the conversation. And that you are uh, still an active 
uh, attending member of the church, but you're also very well informed about church issues and you have a number of questions and we're excited about taking this chance to talk with an apostle and get his take on those. Well, in terms of active, I, 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 I go to church. Um, maybe I'm active enough to not be considered um, inactive, I guess to be semi-active, but you know, I do live in Utah. A, and, a reprobate. <laughs> yeah. Do they count you for purposes of tithing? <laughs> maybe but i guess my tithing goes different places so um I, I don't i don't i also want to be clear like i'm not um i, I i've had good i've had great experiences in in the church um and different things you know and a lot of my my close friends and family are um and i still have this you know spiritual experiences in 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 the church and so it's it is you know kind of interesting even with some of the things that other bednar said i could feel myself on the one hand feeling frustrated or triggered and on the other hand, feeling um, the fruits of the spirit in his presence, you know? Oh, I can't hear you. Oh, when you say fruits of the spirit, are you talking about good feelings or anything more specific than that? Uh, yeah, Galatian stuff. Just just the same feelings that I would feel back when I would be, you know, bearing my testimony um, on, on the mission, you know, teaching in church. You know, just, just that I mean, fruits of the spirit, I just mean my recollection of how I would feel the spirit and that was present during this meeting and that happened uh, simultaneously at the time that I had um, also from frustration about wow why, why how, how could you you know say this or believe this that's that can be very maybe hurtful you know Okay, well, that's probably I'm sorry, I'm sorry I Maven. To one more thing before yeah. just before we go I I couldn't help but think as I was reading through this conversation and, um, and Tyler, you kind of alluded to it as well. I honestly think this conversation was able to go as long as it was specifically because of you and your tactics that you, um, you talk, I say tactics, like it, like it's a bad thing, but, um, um, but no, it really, I, I think it was really wise to, uh, you know, make elder Bednar feel comfortable. Like when you sensed that, I think, um, I think that's what kept this going for as long as it did and get, you know, why we have all of the information and uh, all these answers that we do. So I know, I know I wouldn't have been able to do it um, because I think even if I started off nice, I probably would have gotten upset, <laughs> I think a little early on and I would not have been able to hide, you know, like uh, my disgruntlement. So anyway, I, so I hope our listeners, I know sometimes it can be uh, frustrating if, you know, if people it would say something like what Tyler just did, that he was feeling the fruits of the spirit with Bednar, who's, um, you know, classically unpopular among us. But I really think uh, what he was able to do here was very unique and very valuable. So I just wanted to say that. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Maven. You, Maven. Are, are you re are we ready to go with the, um, the transcript now? Yes. Yeah. M Maven, can I just say, I appreciate you saying that. And, and along with that, sometimes I give answers that, are apologetic and it may or may not be how I truly feel, but I'm trying to ease the tension and move on to a different conversation. And so I, I just, I want the, the readers to also not be under the illusion that um, that was actually a decent answer. And I'm sure as RFM talks about this, um, you know, you'll see it's not the case. I just, I'm trying to be respectful. Like, there's no reason to put him in this situation, in a situation where it's, it's, it's disrespectful. Okay, right. very good. Well, the first line is yours, Tyler. Oh. And uh, Maven, would you take over for Elder Bednar? Yes, I'll do this section. Thank you. Elder Bednar, I wanted to say hi and introduce myself. Tell me your name. Where are you from? Oh, I'm Tyler, and I'm from Utah. I, I've been a strong member my whole life, and I actually had a dream about you three years ago. Was it a nightmare? <laughs> Maybe. No, we, we were having a conversation much like this, and you talked about the importance of obedience to the leaders of the church because of how difficult it can be to discern with the spirit. As in, you know, you have the Denver Snuffer group that I'm sure you're aware of. Uh, we have so many people that read something that makes sense of them. And then they get a spiritual confirmation that this must be how it is with the same testimony that they had before. They are bearing with the, the same eloquence, with the same strength that this newfound belief is the right way. But that always struck me because I felt like there is a safe way in that, well, as long as we are believing and, and teaching, you know, what the brethren have taught us, 
then we can be safe, right? Uh, but then, you know, more recently I've been really reading about spiritual experiences and have seen how that that uh, happens sometimes as, you know, we're, we're all imperfect. Uh, we, we make mistakes. How, how, how can we maintain the faith when we see past, past history, for example, where where we have thought something was true, but uh, then later we decide that it's not necessarily the case. Well, I think it depends on what you are talking about in terms of past history. The problem with church history is when people study it to find contradictions without understanding the context of when those things took place. Okay, so that's the end of the first section. And it's kind of the introduction of this conversation. And I just want to weigh in on this at this point because... This last thing that Elder Bednar says is problematic to me because I really, I can speak for myself, I think, and for a lot of other people, that the problem isn't understanding the context in church history. The problem is actually understanding the context in church history. Elder Bednar seems to be proceeding from a position that if you study church history enough to know the context, <clears throat> excuse me, then that will take care of all the problems and uh, you'll you'll get past it and you'll be able to continue being a faithful Latter-day Saint. What do you think about this, Maven? I I think, so I, and I'll probably keep repeating myself when I say this, I, I couldn't help, but I don't know, this, this transcript as we're calling it, I think has been one of the most successful things, almost like pulling me back into my believing brain. So I, I mean, I still remember, of course, how I used to think about things and I talk about it. I write about it in interactions. I used to think this way, or I even said this. And I think that's kind of the hardest thing sometimes about being on this side is uh, when you're talking to other people or, and still believing members is, is kind of hearing the echoes of your own previous ignorance you know um coming through but um but they're usually a, a really tiny snippets going through this whole thing really i, I don't know it's almost i felt like my old self again i guess if that makes sense um and uh mm -hmm. i think it was good because i um i think i lost a lot of i, I don't know i, I get sometimes i'm just kind of sad about the church and sometimes i'm a little heated and spicy about it and um, and I didn't expect it, especially with Bednar, because he is also not my favorite apostle, um, to put it lightly. But I actually felt, yeah, kind of a, I guess, a connection. I, I just he, he really helped me understand my old self, I guess. And so I wasn't there were definitely things that bothered me that are problematic. And we'll talk about them when we get there. But um, yeah, I guess that was kind of my feeling throughout the whole thing. But it is kind of the same old, same old. You, there's just things that you're not able to understand as a member because you just can't let your mind go there. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And I will say the other thing is that he seems to also say that the problem with church history, the only reason that you find contradictions in church history is if you're looking, you're looking for them for right. them. Yeah. And, and I and wasn't, I, totally I think this, yeah. People yeah I wasn't looking, looking for them, uh, but just because I wasn't looking for them doesn't mean I didn't find them. They're there whether you look for them or not. Well, and see, I always thought that there were like there were always faithful answers because the church was true, right? That's the baseline assumption. So if there's anything that looks bad, there's a good reason behind it. Either that bad thing is not the truth and it's it's a lie, or if you get go in really, really deep, um, then there's there's totally a reasonable answer. I just never had the time to go looking, you know? Yes. Did you want to throw in on this, Tyler? Um, j just two things. One, um, just to push back a little bit, I, my question is not very clear. I, I, To be honest, I felt nervous. This was difficult. This is a man that I had, have had such respect for um, fr from such early days and, and you know, through my mission and things, and now I'm talking to him. And so this transcript, you know, as I was reading that, that really is like what I said. It's kind of not very clear. It's all over the place. What are you getting at? And, and I could tell he's trying to figure out what I'm asking. Where am I going with this? And I, I want to just dive in and ask questions and things. But I, then I knew like, oh, I better not go there. And that's kind of what I was trying to feel, feel this comfort level of where, where I can start talking about and feeling comfortable with. And so it takes just a little bit to get in that. And, and so my question is not very clear. 
And I'm thinking in the same way, yes, he did give this answer like, well, the problem with church history is not the contradiction, it's the context. That's common. But I'm also thinking he's trying to come up with something to respond to my very ambiguous, vague question. Okay, well, very good. I appreciate your keeping us uh, on a level playing field with Elder Bednar. But now you get into the 2015 slash 19 policy of exclusion, and then it's reversal three years later. I'm sorry, what? It is a pretty big one to start with, um, funnily enough. But um, but yeah, no, I agree. I think you did handle this well. Actually, this was just another random thought. I really do feel like when it comes to members of the church, but especially I would think um, general authorities and apostles in interacting with the public, just just because there's such a chance for it to be fraught and and and, and we know there's a bit of a persecution complex out there already. So it's really, really easy for a member to shut down at any sign, any hint just the barest, barest hint is enough. It's almost like you have to, it's almost like approaching a baby deer. I feel like you just have to do it real gentle, real calm, you know, just kind of holding your hand out there. And I feel like, I feel like you did that, Tyler. So yeah, who um, knows? Yeah. It could end up on Mormonism live. <laughs> well, well, thank you. And, you know, I have to say just one other thing that maybe I've, I've never had this before. And I've talked to many people, you know, very famous in other circles or whatever. Elder, Elder Ben Nar, when I was talking to him, it was difficult to have a conversation, normal conversation with him, because when I would say something, he would then just look at my eyes and be silent and not say anything. See, normally when we're talking, as soon as there are small pause, the other person immediately jumps in and starts, you know, talking. The conversation is fluid. With him, it wasn't. I would be talking and 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 multiple times for him to say something or never did that. And then when I, when I would ask a question, there was almost always a pause and it mm. felt like eternity. It might've only been a second or so, but because of that, it made me somewhat ramble on a little bit more. Mm. Um, and, and it kind of made it, made me feel a little bit more nervous and a little bit more like this, noticing this power differential and everything inside of me was telling me, okay, the conversation is over. I'm done talking to him. This is not comfortable. I want to go, but Something inside of me also told me you have the power. Stay with and stay with it and talk to him. You do have the power, and we've got a lot more to go through. And uh, we're doing great so far. By the way, those pauses. Uh, I understand that occasionally Elder Bednar does have to stop to reboot. <laughs> so that may be part of it. I feel like it's a tactic. This uh, this was um uh. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Priesthood dispatches. He used to be a bishop. And so and he did a, a Mormon stories interview. And I'm just going to say this real quick. But he said it, just doing the temple recommend interviews was really difficult for him. And he was a very young bishop as well. And so this this is part of his story coming out. It's, it's very tragic, actually. But he would say that one of the things he would do it just before an interview, he would just pick one of the questions randomly that he was going to pause like that on. And so he would answer, he would ask the question, they would answer, and he would just sit and stare at him and see if anything else came up. And, and to him, that's what he thought maybe was like some discernment or, you know, was maybe an idea given to him by the spirit to, to kind of see. But, but, you know, he's like in afterwards, I'm just winging it. So I really, I do think there is a very deliberate, I think that was very deliberately done on Bednar's part. Yeah, um, I know priesthood dispatches and I'll wager he always did that on the, the law of chastity question. I mean, I don't know. I, I think probably the big ones, but and, and word of wisdom, maybe. I don't remember if he actually said which ones um, it was, but he just tried to, he just picked one, he said, so. Okay, I, I think it might be a, a strategy as well. So do you, you want, you're you going to keep playing Tyler, and Maven and I are going to switch back and forth, and mainly that's because uh, Maven's doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes and banning a lot of people from the live chat. All right, <laughs> I'll go. <clears throat> So one thing that I'm thinking about that is more recent is, uh, well, my understanding of the 2015 exclusion policy, and, and that one was, was a while ago, and I didn't really understand it, but it didn't really bother me so much because I didn't know so much about the issue. But then I hear all this controversy and all these things, and I'm like, oh, those are really good points, you know? Uh, but President Nelson talked about it in Hawaii, where he said they received revelation that it was God uh, wanted at that time. But that it was, but then it was rescinded back in 2019, or changed, basically reversed, also by the will of God. As this is an important change to make, I'm not sure. In, in that case, we have, on the one hand, 
I'm being kind of facetious. I mean, other Bednar is looking at me like he's not like where this is going. So this is really hard. So I'm saying I'm, I'm, I'm being kind of facetious uh, just to make a case about this. But, but on the one hand, we're saying it was revelation to enact the policy. And then we're saying it was revelation to not have the policy as an example. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Okay, Radio Free Mormon playing Elder Bednar. Okay, so in the early days of the Restoration, the admonition to all the saints all over the world was to come to Zion. In the 1970s, President Kimball said, stay where you're at. So God gives revelations that don't contradict. Those were revelations that are appropriate at different seasons in the history of the church. And it doesn't have to be a hundred years time for that to be the case. So there's no reason to say that one revelation was not true. Another revelation, in this case, even though they're only three years apart or so, they, well, they're they not necessarily mutually exclusive. That's right. They're not contradictory. President Nelson talks about the ongoing restoration. Yes, very much. It used That's to where be... I want to jump in, actually. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, I have go ahead. That, obviously. I mean, I know, like, he's going to give an example. We're not done with the section. but. Um, I, I don't know. I'm just surprised at the boldness. They're not contradictory. I, I, I don't. I want to know what he thinks contradictory is. If he's if he says one thing, uh, and then at the exact same moment he says the opposite, that would be contradictory. But if there's a second's worth of space between the two, they're not. I mean, how could it be more clear? <laughs> I'm really getting to this elder Bednar role, I can tell. Yeah, I, I just don't think the ongoing restoration fixes that. So, No, Sorry. but it's a good slogan. But, but, yeah. but RFM, um, yeah. elder Bednar would disagree with your time idea, as we'll see in the next statement. Oh, okay. So let's see, where was I before Maven stepped on my line? Um, <laughs> right, right here. Oh, it used to be the case. Thank you. It, <laughs> It used to be the case that you would come to Zion because that's where the temples were. Now the church has the resources to take the temples to the people. Those aren't contradictory. They're progressing. Interjection. I almost said, yeah, they have the resources. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> You ain't just whistling Dixie there, Elder Bednar. Uh, I didn't, though. Anyway, <clears throat> I said... Um, yeah, I, I had one of my missionary companions reach out to me some time ago. We had some similar conversations. He was a son of a state president, but he had a lot of, you know, concerns and things. And I talked about the ongoing restoration. And I said, well, maybe you can, I said, well, to tell the brother, maybe you can correct me, my thinking. But I said, perhaps the church is more true now than it was in the days of Joseph Smith, because look at how much things have changed. It's a continuing restoration. Okay, and back to me being Elder Bednar refusing to take the bait. Yeah, I wouldn't say that the church is more true now, but certainly we have been given more revelation. I had mixed feelings on this as well. Okay, so that's the end of that section? Yeah. Okay, what are your mixed feelings? Well, I mean, I guess I, guess I can see it both ways, that, that you can have truth maybe less of it but like what all that you have is truth and you can add more i think that's probably where he is going um well i know because he says that you wouldn't necessarily say the truth is more true now um yeah i don't know because on the other hand i, I there's just so many things that are so different well like so the name of the church you're right right yeah that, that'd be one small example I looked at this and I did not find his example about gathering to Zion versus not gathering to Zion exactly on point with what you're talking about, Tyler, because to make it on point, you would have to almost say that the church was teaching its members to gather to Zion then, and they've been doing that for a long time, then announce a revelation saying they should not gather to Zion. Then three years later, announce another revelation saying they should once more gather to Zion. See, it's when I look at it this way that I understand how it makes God look like a supreme being who either doesn't know the future or who, for some reason, is acting like a doddering old man. 
Well, and just to say earlier, maybe when he just scroll up a little bit, maybe it was just uh, to Elder Benner's earlier comment uh, right there, he, where he says those are revelations are appropriate at different seasons in the history, and it doesn't have to be a hundred years time for that to be a case. So he's making a point that it doesn't matter if it's one second away or a hundred years away. That it, you know, with God, there is no time type concept. Um, but but yeah, you know, I, I didn't push it further in in terms of him saying, well, if God is, you know, om, omnipotent, uh, well, omniscient, I guess in this case, um, and he could see the fallout that would occur, right? Um, and I, I thought about asking more about what his thoughts with, with everything that did happen. I mean, the suicides in Utah went up and, you know, lots of resignations. Um, but, but at the same time, you know, you could also argue God is testing the saints. I mean, that is the cleansing of America, the, the cleansing of the, you know, the Cleon's cows and we'll talk about, you know, this, <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I didn't go there is all right. because I, and, could, and I understand why possible. not, because otherwise that would have been the end of the conversation probably. Yeah. So what's really important and what I, the service I think you did was to give Elder Bednar the chance to express how he feels about these issues. Yeah. So uh, anything else before we go on, Maven or Tyler? I'm having trouble with my voice. So RFM, if you can actually get this again, I'm going to switch out my drink, if that's okay. Sure, sure thing. So I'll be Elder Bednar in this next section too. Yeah, if you'll do it again, let me go ahead and get scroll. I think, actually, I might be the only one in control of this one. So yes, you are. You have absolute quick. power. <laughs> So this is under faith and logic. And Tyler, once again, you start off. All right. So what do we say to people who have lost their faith? I mean, for them, it's like they really enjoyed the belief in Santa Claus as a child. But once you know that isn't true, you can't just believe again. Well, as Elder Bednar, well, the main difference is that the church is true and Santa Claus is not. Problem solved. <laughs> oh, Yeah. That makes sense now. I mean, but I mean, even if people really wanted to believe in Santa again, uh, they can't just sing more songs and choose to believe. They have studied these issues. And even though they want to believe, they just can't do it because it doesn't make sense. It's like trying to believe in Santa again. And then Elder Bednar responds, um, I don't think they really want to believe. If they did, then they wouldn't stop studying and reading. If they really studied and read these areas, they would actually have stronger faith. So I don't believe that they really want to believe the church is true if they are not studying the scriptures to allow them to believe and know it is true. Your thoughts, Maven? Um, I think out of everything, this is the thing that's bothered me the most. Um. Yeah, and I, it's not anything new <laughs> that we haven't heard before. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, it, again, this is it bothers me because of the content, but it also bothers me because I hear myself in this so much because I just I believed so much for so long that this absolutely was the truth and the true church. And that there was always a good answer. There always, always was. I I had no choice but to think. I mean, calling back to what he said earlier, that, that people are looking for things. Um, or I guess I also thought sometimes that people just heard bad stuff and didn't do any research at all. Like they just believed all their life, learned all of this stuff about Joseph Smith. And then one day someone was like, he married a teenager. And they went, oh, my gosh. And then just left out over it. You know, I just... It's, it's so ignorant. And so I just really, I think that's why I'm maybe not as upset as I usually am. I don't know. I just see myself so much in this. Well, I agree with you. This is um, something that kind of upset me a little bit too, because once again, it levels this accusation against me and other people who are in my position that of course it's the member's fault for not really wanting to believe. This is insulting to me and the many other members who studied and studied and studied because they wanted more than anything else for the church to be true. That's my story. It's not my story alone. A lot of people are in that boat. I wanted to believe. And guess what? 
I still haven't stopped studying and reading, but it has not made my faith stronger. So Elder Bednar's position is obviously wrong on this, at least to me. And what Elder Bednar is ultimately saying, I think, is that no matter what our studies of church history and the scriptures tell us about the church and how it was really organized and what really happened, somehow just continuing to read the scriptures is going to make those issues go away as if by magic. It is the same sort of advice people with real issues get from their local leaders when they take substantial issues that are really bothering them to them. And that advice is usually pray, pay tithing, be obedient, attend church, study the scriptures and conference talks, and stay away from anything that's challenging about the church. It is a remedy that has nothing to do with the problem. Your Agreed. thoughts, Tyler? You know, this is the one section I had a difficult time recollecting exactly what was he was saying because he went on a tangent a little bit about this. But this is in principle what he was saying, um, specifically that he doesn't believe that people um, stop, uh, that people really wanted to believe that um, that the more they studied, they would they would leave. And this is hurtful, I know, I know um, to a lot of people. Um, the idea of lazy learners, for example, are never able to muster even a particle of faith, um, that if you will just study this longer. But I, I want to say, kind of as Maven said too, we've all been there, and that's when we are so certain that the church is true in every way, all the claims, when you're certain that Joseph Smith did translate the Egyptian papyra, or he did not use a seer stone, or, or different things of this nature, um, if, if that's the conclusion is as clear as you can be, you, you couldn't expect a different answer. So I just, I'm just saying, um, although it is hurtful, I can't imagine a different perspective for him to have, because he does believe it. And then number two, as we go through this, even in the next section especially, we see that actually Elder Bednar does not understand the issues very well at all. And because of that, we can't actually expect him to really understand why this analogy to Santa Claus is actually more fitting than not. Yes, before we go on to the next question, I did wanna say that too. And. and Again, it, it's the same thing I would have done, just really flipping. Well, obviously, Santa Claus isn't real because, like, you can see, you can prove it. You know, you, I guess, hopefully, there was no children watching the show um, younger than like 10 years old. But Oops. anyway, yeah, but you know, we don't market ourselves as a, a children's show anyway. So, um, but yeah, I think I, this, along with almost everything that he says and almost everything that members say, is I'm really starting to see it as stop stopping. It's, it's a phrase that you tell yourself like to end the conversation in your own mind so that you don't have to engage with it anymore. And that's the real purpose of most of these um, these kinds of phrases. So, Can I really quickly address any children who might have been traumatized by the recent discussion we just had? I'm going to solve all their problems by paraphrasing what Elder Bednar just said. I don't think that anybody who doesn't believe in Santa anymore, I don't think they really want to believe in Santa. If they did, then they wouldn't stop studying and reading about Santa. If they really studied and read about Santa, they would actually have stronger faith in Santa. So I don't believe that they really want to believe in Santa Claus and that he's real. If they're not studying about Santa and allowing them to believe and know that Santa is true. Wonderful. But a boom. I had another thought, but... Um... Shoot, I lost it. Oh, well, let us know if you did. You, you know, just get I, it back. I got it. Yeah, I got it back. It's just when when people when members of the church, not just Bel, uh, Bednar, say stuff like this about about reading more in the scriptures. This is one thing that if someone had asked me, I don't know how I would have answered. Sorry, I got a mint in my mouth. As a as a believer, um, what exactly is it that people are thinking is really going to happen by this extra? study. I don't know how I would have answered that if somebody had asked me when I was a believer, because these conversations never went past that point. And so I honestly don't know how I, I may have answered. And it's something that still kind of stumps me now. And so 
um, it just happened to me uh, earlier this year for last conference. It was, it was, I was on Twitter. I was kind of doing, I don't know. I was living on Twitter and I had so many members of the church invite me to general conference uh, like that upcoming weekend. And it was always like just in response to all the problems I was bringing up. And I just, I asked some, but they never answered either. So maybe it's just, you just don't even let yourself go there. But what is listening to conference going to do about any of these problems? Yeah. Well, I think the idea is you're going to feel the spirit and that's going to help you uh, understand that your problems don't amount to a hill of beans in this crazy world. I guess. But also this whole idea about keep studying, keep studying. What it strikes me is it's a stopgap measure. It's a way of kicking the can down the road. And it's a way of putting a condition on it that need never be met. In other words, if you keep studying and studying, but you still don't have your questions answered, well, then you need to keep studying. It's something that you will always have in front of you like a carrot in front of a donkey's nose, right? And you'll keep chasing the carrot until finally, I mean, you can never catch it. And then finally you you die and uh, you get buried in your temple garments. And that's the end of that story. And you and they tell stories of how faithful you were and tell your progeny to, to live that way as well. Very good. Right. Tyler, did you have anything you wanted to say before we went on to race in the pre-mortal life? Um, I, I think I said it. it yeah, I, 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 yeah. Okay, I Maven, you. you've got a mint in your oh, mouth. Sorry. Yeah, no, not anymore. And you keep wanting to like move us along. I know. Are you going to be able to be Elder Bednar yeah. now? <clears throat> really? Yeah, I, I don't know. We'll try. Um, but just really quick, I just want to say this. This was one of the most surprising things to me in deconstructing the church because my my faith deconstruction did not happen through Mormonism directly. I'd lost faith in God and the Bible first, just Christian, just all of it all at once. So the Mormon specific stuff came after. And I realized that there's nothing in the church that I have found, not one single thing that looks better with more research. That was all I wanted to say. Okay. Well, obviously you just need to keep studying all those issues more. <laughs> Maybe it gets worse and worse. Maybe it's like, it does like the inverse kind of a loop thing. It just looks bad. And then all of a sudden it just looks amazing. You learned something that makes it all rosy. I'm I don't sensing know. you don't really want to believe. <laughs> well, you know, in a way, maybe it's true. because the Stuff that has happened and the stuff that's taught is so terrible. So, mm. I you guess know, sometimes not wanting to believe something is not a bad thing. Yeah. Well, you know, now I do want to make a comment. <laughs> uh, you know, I, 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 I believe there is some inspiration with the Book of Abraham, the Book of Mormon, different things. I, I don't believe that there was a literal translation as peering on the stone and, and, or whatever. But I would love to believe that. I love magic. RFM, I think you do too. Mm -hmm. If What's magic were real. See my thumb? Can you see my thumb? <laughs> Can you see that? Can you see that, Maven? Yes, I see. I see. Okay. I'm watching. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> how how yeah, how, how do you how do you even do that, you know? Uh I could tell you but then I'd have to kill myself. <laughs> better you than me. <laughs> um but but I'm just saying I would love to believe that. I would love to believe I can look at a rock and channel and see into these visions and all of these things and and not only would I love to, I'm willing to believe that. I did for a lot of my life in a very literal sense. And, but, but you know, I'm, you know, have much more academic in my science training and different things now. And I'm still am compelled to go where the evidence shows me. Mm -hmm. And if there is evidence that you can really do this, I will be the first one to sign up and do it because I would love that. So I, I am in no way... And I think a lot of people are like this. They're not just, oh, I don't want to believe that or I can't believe that or something. No, they would love to believe that. Just, you know, let me look at the evidence because you can't just, just like with Santa Claus, you can't just wish yourself to believe and all of a sudden you believe it like you did when you were a child. Right. Right. It does strike me that. Um, Mormonism. Yeah. I, oh, I'm sorry, I what? Think, I was going to say it's a, a completely different Mormonism. I believed very different things about the church when I was younger. And so it was rosy and it was nice to believe and so yeah i wouldn't understand why anyone wouldn't want to believe those things but those things weren't true and so you know and once you have to face the truth it's really really awful and and that is something that 
I, I think if you can, if you have the ability to be authentic with yourself, you would not want to believe. So. <clears throat> okay, we, are we All ready right. to go on with the next yes. section? Yes. All right. For some, uh, it can be hard sometimes to believe that what the brethren are saying is true. When we look at the history, we notice contradictions. There are no contradictions in the doctrines and revelations. The doctrines are those taught in the scriptures, <clears throat> repeatedly taught in general conference, in proclamations and first presidency statements. Uh, well, yes, uh, perhaps the appearance of them. Another example might be the past teachings on race in the priesthood band, which was linked to valiancy in the premortal life. I read the 1949 first presidency statement that says something like, with reference to Negroes not having the priesthood, this is not a matter of policy, but a doctrine from the foundation of the church, that they are not entitled to receive the priesthood. This doctrine is understood when we consider another doctrine that, that they were less valiant than the premortal life. And interjection, I'm trying to quote the first presidency statement, which does use the word Negro. And I did say Negro to Elder Bednar, but I'm not trying to be disrespectful either. I'm just trying to stay true to the original quote. We'd have to look to see if the first presidency actually ever said that or what was said. Oh, I, I agree. That was my first thought when I read it. But it was By the way, can I break in here for just a second? Sorry, I know we're not done with this section, but I just want to make a couple comments because the first thing was that I was kind of excited that Elder Bednar shows his age by referencing first presidency statements as a source of doctrines. Because that's certainly what I was raised with, and I'm not quite as old as Elder Bednar. But apparently he hasn't completely gotten on the new bandwagon. The doctrine is in the scriptures, and it's basically what all of the, the, the apostles say and teach with a united voice. But first presidency statements, that's old school. The first presidency doesn't get to establish doctrine anymore. It has to be all 15 together. So I thought that was interesting. Another thing was where he had said something about Oh, there are no contradictions in the doctrines and revelations. I mean, this is a nice bumper sticker, but on what planet has Elder Bednar been living? I, I have looked at and discussed and studied so many contradictions. I, I can't possibly even remember them all right now. I mean, but an obvious one is about lecture on faith number five, where it gives a very different description of the Godhead than the one given by Joseph Smith that I think it was 1843 in Ramos, Illinois. It's either section 130 or 131 of the Doctrine and Covenants in which we continue to promote today. That's an obvious contradiction or maybe under Elder Bednar's test, it's not a contradiction because they were given at different times. Right, I just wanted to say we've we've got um, Debbie Jo and Camille dishing it in the comments. So if for future dishing? listeners, um, so I think Debbie Joe's uh, husband had uh, a close relationships with a, a lot of general authorities, it seems like. So there's some pretty funny stories in here. So I, I just think if anyone's watching on YouTube after this, um, they should turn on the live chat and check. And then Camille um, was an assistant uh, to general authorities, and she's done a Mormon stories. And, and so she's uh, dishing a little bit as well. So I just want to Close encounters of the general authority kind. Yeah. Um, and I think there might be more that I'm missing, so I, I apologize um, to anyone else I'm missing, but there's some good stuff coming out here. Thanks sorry. for bringing that up, Maven. And I'm sorry, my interruption is over. You may continue with the dialogue. Okay. Where were, where were we? Oh, before I was I <laughs> Cut me off. <laughs> yeah, with the first pregnancy. So I said, uh, oh, I agree. That was the first thought I had when I read it, but it was easy enough to find on Feral DS website. It was a common teaching at the time and taught us doctrine. And I mean, interjecting, I could tell he was feeling uncomfortable. And so I quickly offered a apologetic response. So I said, my thinking uh, to help reconcile this statement is that these are great men who were also products of their time and culture. I, I mean, just like you, they went to primary and learned these core teachings as have been taught since Brigham Young and were taught to never question the brethren. So when they were called to be an apostle, why would they question? What the previous apostles and prophets taught they, they they probably never actually prayed about it but just believed it was true so it wasn't until there was a reason to question it that they started to pray about it what do you think of my response well i wouldn't say that they would never question the teachings but yes not everything is always clear from the lord from the beginning 
Yes, by I mean, the way, by the way, can I just ask something? Is Elder Bednar tipping his hand at all here, talking about saying, I don't think that apostles, he's one of them, would never question the teachings? I think that's an interesting tacit possible admission on his part that either he or others of his brethren do have occasions where they question the teachings. What do you think about that, Tyler? Um, I thought about asking him to elaborate on that a little bit more um, because he did just say that there are no contradictions in the doctrines and the revelations. And Elder Oaks talked about policies being essentially indistinguishable from doctrines when you consider a, a church with 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 revelation. And so I, I but I maybe may, he's probably just getting the idea that, um, you know, it's 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 okay to question because questions leads to faith. What's not okay is doubt. And he, I, I I thought if I went on this, then he would probably go that route and and try to get a, get rid of this idea that um, it's never good to question. Um, and he tried to separate doubts from questions. Questions, of course, lead to faith. Doubts lead to not faith in this kind of uh, illogical concept, basically. So I decided not to go that route um that's what i initially read into it too but your point was interesting rfm well the background that i have which i got right before the show started from a well-placed source otherwise unspecified is that right now the top 15 apostles in the lds church are being quote unquote torn apart over the issue of lgbtq treatment in the church and so if that's correct, and I actually I kind of think it is, uh, just looking at what ha has happened over the course of the last decades, but to have then Elder Bednar say, I wouldn't say that they would never question the teaching seems to take on new significance to me. Interesting. But yeah, going, interesting. <clears throat> going on? Okay. I said, uh, yes, I mean, like even garments, I, they used to go down to the ankles and wrists, and it was taught by prophets that they can't be altered or mutilated, as, was re the re as, what, as it was the revealed pattern given to Joseph Smith. However, it wasn't until garments started to be a problem that the brethren started to research it and pray about it, and they learned that it was only the markings that were revealed, and so then they had no problem changing the garment. We could maybe say the same thing about the many changes in the temple. Yes, everything is given line upon line and precept upon precept. And that's the end of that section, to which my only other comment was, revelation is when my church changes, apostasy is when your church changes. <laughs> right. What, do you have any other thoughts about that, Maven? Um, sorry, let me... Scroll back up. I have this on three different screens, actually, like the same. So I, I keep if. Yeah. Anyway. Um, no, like, no, I don't. We, we can keep going. I'll, I'll just say he actually didn't really want to talk about this at all. As soon as I mentioned the temple and the garments and things, I could tell it's time to move on. And so he says something and this quote from him may not have been exactly right, but this is the idea. It was time to move on. And so I did. Right. And after I said change in the temple, notice there's no question after that. A normal person, not that he's not normal, but I mean, they would have <laughs> talked and, and started a conversation with that. There was dead silence. And 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 so I knew it was going to be, you know, just the conversation is going to end. And so he said something along this line. And then I quickly, you know, went on to another topic. You know, I, I can't. Be, sorry. No, maybe go be ahead. Interesting because I. Um, I just I realized now with what what you were saying, the fact that he doesn't push back against that is very interesting because he has pushed back against things that, I mean, all, that are really obvious to all of us. Like there have been no changes to the doctrine. That's not a pushback I would expect, you know, but I, I think it's a sincere belief of his. So it is interesting that when you talk about like these temple changes and garment changes, um, he didn't want to push back on that. Even if we know it would be ridiculous, I think he also this one he knows yeah and once again um i don't know about elder bednar but i would think a normal person at this point in the conversation would start to recognize that they're talking with a person who really knows his stuff yeah 
maybe you were making him feel pretty intimidated and the pauses were just him trying to get control back. Maybe. We'll see. <laughs> Do we have another section to go? Yes, let's, here we go. All right. So with the race idea, uh, in 2 Nephi 5, it talks about how the skin of the Lamanites was changed. Uh, you're probably familiar with the 2020 print version of the Come Follow Me manual, which he was smiling at this point looking at me, so he was very aware of it. Uh, which stated that the dark skin was not the curse, but a sign of the curse. However, the online version doesn't have that, and Elder Stevenson said the print version was an error. I had brought this up with some faithful members and suggested that perhaps the Book of Mormon was not literally referring to changing the skin color, but was uh, more symbolic, to which the members were appalled that I did not believe what the scriptures obviously said, since it is as clear as day. But what do you think? Does the church require us to believe that God truly changed the skin color of the Lamanites? Or can we think of it as being more symbolic? I think it's your turn. Yeah, it's your turn, isn't it, Arthur? Oh, okay. I'm, I'm Melder Bednar. Um, this is a great question, by the way. I would say that the meaning of those verses and the mechanism for how God did things has not been fully revealed. I agree. It, it does sound like you're saying that we don't really know. And so it's a viable interpretation to believe that the skin color change was more symbolic and not literal. Again, the meaning and interpretation of all of these areas has not been fully revealed. He's not going to commit himself it. one way or the other on this. Yeah, which was interesting. And, and again, I felt some level of discomfort. And so I, I, I wanted to ask a follow-up question and just be more direct, like, do we really believe this is what it is? And, and even why I'm asking, is it okay? I'm, I'm, I guess I'm leading the question a little bit, um, priming him to say yes, by asking, is it okay for us to believe that this is symbolic? Because, of course, you know, all the apologists put, put that out there. But it, I've never seen a statement from a general authority um, you know, to say that's okay. He didn't say it's okay, but at the he same, didn't say it's not okay. Exactly. I think I think this would be a good opportunity if he wanted to, where he could say the Book of Mormon is pretty clear that God brought a skin of blackness upon them, and 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 so and on and on. Right? He didn't he didn't say any of that. Um, so I, I did find that interesting, and I, I and and obviously he is aware of of this situation. I'm sure, Maven. Did you have something? Yeah, um, this was interesting to me just because of the apologetics that are being put out there. You know, that the skin is clothing, or I think in the dialogue journal, they were actually saying like it's literally paint because they found ancient body paint. And so is the Lamanites painting themselves black, just, just the most ridiculous things. And um, this is kind of juxtaposed, like juxtaposed with uh, Mike uh, from LDS Discussions and his series that um, he's got going on weekly is about race and the priesthood. And um, so I, I don't know, this this was something that kept coming up and there was somebody, so I I, this, I don't know, uh, RFM, if you're familiar with Marvin Perkins, he's a black member of the church who's an apologist, you know, who will, um, you know, and so there was somebody in the chat that just kept saying over and over, like, have you guys listened to Marvin Perkins? Like, I know just because he's black, like if, if it's the same thing everyone else is saying, but it's coming from a black person, then that makes it okay. And, and you just have to believe it now. But it was funny to me because he kept saying, like Marvin is saying, it's just an idiom. It's just a phrase. And so every time he said it, I just kept asking, okay, what does that say about people when black skin is an idiom for wickedness? Why is that the correlation? What does that say about people who have that? And they never answered me, but every once in like every 20 minutes, they'd come like pop up back in the chat, just be like, did anybody listen to Marvin Perkins? And um, so, yeah, I finally at the end, um, well, no, they just kept saying you should listen. And then at the end, they said, did anybody listen to what Marvin Perkins had to say? And so then I, I put in, is it is it that it's an idiom? And they were like, yes. And I just, <laughs> it was just a funny thing. I don't know. They just kept repeating it. But I was surprised that Bednar said that this has not been revealed that the meaning of those verses has not been revealed and i just wonder it could be any verse why is it's just these problematic ones that make the church look really racist that the real meaning of hasn't been revealed but the 
you know, the really good scriptures, you know, I, I must go and do the things the Lord commands, you know, um, no one's saying that the real meaning of that one hasn't yet been revealed. <laughs> right, right. Can I give just uh, my gut reaction the first time I read this, when he said, uh, I would say the meaning of those verses and the mechanism for how God did things has not been fully revealed. My initial reaction, what I wrote down was what a dodge. Really? It isn't clear. God hasn't revealed it clearly enough. And what are apostles and prophets good for if they can't even answer questions like this? This just seems like a patented dodge to avoid difficult questions, blaming it on God now that God hasn't gotten around to revealing it. Notice nothing is ever the leader's fault. It is always somebody else. The members most often, but sometimes even God has to be blamed. Well, um, you know, we used to know that it means what it says. And we have numerous accounts of apostles and prophets directly saying it is not metaphysical or, or it, it is metaphysical. It is a literal change. I mean, even the idea that when you are baptized, the Gentiles baptize, those that do not literally contain the blood of, of, of Israel will actually contain that blood, an actual change in your DNA. I mean, th these are the things that we were, were taught by prophets and apostles. And, and as I you know, got older, I, I, yes, I became more nuanced and, and, I, and I saw things differently and I, I prefer this symbolic. And there's some, you know, Marvin Perkins and, and others, apologists have actually given some really interesting ways of how the Book of Mormon shows that you know, it couldn't have been you know, an actual skin color change. And, of course, others could just say, well, that's because Joe Smith wasn't very coherent in his writing or something. But need, need that, uh, that was a different topic. But I'm just saying that the, the, there has been many prophets in general conference, you know, going back to what Elder uh, Bednar said, it constitutes his doctrine. Well, let's look at what was said in general conference then by, and was taught as united front by multiple prophets and apostles for generations. And it means exactly what the scriptures say. And to Maven's point, if you... You, if you can't um, accept that that scripture directly says what it says, then how can you accept any scripture? Because that's one of the most, that's one of the clearest scriptures that there are. And all the clear scriptures, like DC section 77, verse 6, which we, I think we mentioned later, right, that the earth is 6,000 years old. And we have, you know, prophet Joseph Fielding Smith that says, this is a clear revelation that God himself is saying, declaring that the earth is 6,000 years old. But now we actually can't interpret that scripture to mean what it actually exactly says. And I, I, I find that interesting. And I guess to your point, um, RFM, um, Elder Bednar is an apostle. This is why we, he, he, could, he could eradicate the race problem right here. If he's willing to say, we don't know, then he could, they could say, um, that's not what it means or, or change something. You know, there's so many ways about this that um, it's, 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 it's ready to be changed. I agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. And, you know, I know I'm getting up there in years a bit long in the tooth. I was baptized in 1978 when President Kimball was the president of the church. And it is within that time period that I remember President Kimball, especially spearheading the Indian placement program with stories about how their skin would and even had get lighter. Yes over time and as they became active members of the LDS church. So this isn't something you actually have to go all the way back to Brigham Young for. This is within my own membership in the church. Yeah. Are we I going on to the Book of Mormon yeah, Literal well, History? It would be a fun oh. activity to come up with other verses from scripture that we could say the mechanism has not been fully revealed and just kind of come up with nonsensical like alternative meanings. If I anybody's mean, bored, you know. <laughs> uh, let's just take Acts chapter 4, verse 12, right? About Jesus Christ. Uh, is it, I can't even remember what it is, but it's through his blood that we're saved, right? That he's the Savior. In him and through him and of him, we're saved. Right. Okay. <laughs> so who's to say that means what it says? But the same, yeah, what does saved mean? <laughs> yeah, it hasn't been revealed. Right. There you go. Yeah. But the doctrine is found in the scriptures. Oh, good point. Good point. The doctrine's found in the scriptures. We just don't know what it means. There you go. <laughs> That's why we need apostles and prophets. 
that's the that's the selling point, isn't it, of the LDS Church? And apparently, yeah. they are asleep at the wheel. The Book of Mormon literal history question mark is the next section. And now I'm Bednar. I think this time. Yeah. Okay, I completely agree. I appreciate your answer because it allows more nuance and non-literalism with the Book of Mormon. I've had members accuse me of not believing that the Book of Mormon is a literal historical record, which I, I don't even know why they would accuse me of that or why it really matters. I mean, if someone finds the Book of Mormon to be scripture and spiritually uplifting and brings you closer to Christ, then does it really matter about believing in its historicity? I, I think this was you giving quite a lot of leeway. I, I, interesting. Sorry, RFM, you leaned forward. Oh, that's okay. Go ahead. No, that's that's all I, I wanted to say. Um, the Book of Mormon is a powerful book of scripture, and it has changed the hearts of people all across the world, those with very diverse cultural backgrounds. Where did you serve your mission? Now, this is interesting to me because it's a non-responsive response, and then with a, a question designed to distract from your question that you've raised, Tyler. Uh, no, I, I had to push back on that. I think I think he specifically asked me that question so we could talk about my own experience of how the Book of Mormon changes uh, as, as we see in the next in the next thing. So I, I don't think it was a dodge at all. But that's not the issue you raised. Uh, that's true. But I think, uh -huh. yeah, you're right in that. I, you know what? You're right. It, it was a dodge in my actual question, but not a dodge of changing the subject completely. He wants to go back to focus on the Book of Mormon changing people's hearts. So, well, of course he does. Right. So I, I, I continue. Uh, Puerto Rico. <laughs> and I agree. I, I had an investigator, and, and at this time I felt he was a little uncomfortable. So I wanted to sh let him know I have had meaningful experiences on my mission in other places, right? Um, I had an investigator who wasn't so interested initially, but we got her to read the Book of Mormon during our lesson, and she started crying as the spirit was so strong. And then she just said she knows it is true, and, and that is a true experience. And it, and you know, it's it's still interesting how powerful that moment was, and what it means is another question. But it was interesting. Exactly, it happens all the time. A fraudulent book couldn't do this. You can't make a book like this up. Other Christians might study the Bible, but they will never learn as much about Christ as you can from the Book of Mormon. I, um, just an interjection, the, I didn't know how to respond to that. Because when he's talked about a fraudulent book couldn't do this, what, what about the newly revealed sealed portion of the Book of Mormon and how many members are, have, have left and believe in that? You know, what What about the Quran? What about all these other books? And, you know, and but then right after he said that, and I was getting out for that question, he says, these other Christians might study the Bible and you'll never learn as much about Christ as you can from the Book of Mormon. That, and anyway, I, I, I felt like I need to go a different direction because I felt myself feeling frustrated a little bit. And, and that's why I respond the way I do. Um, yes, it is a very powerful and truly another testament of Jesus Christ. That seems to be the purpose. But some members are of opinion that if you don't accept the Book of Mormon as a literal, historical, authentic record, trying to bring him back, okay, um, that you just don't have faith. But is that a requirement? I mean, with all the anachronisms and even the errors of the King James Version translators appearing in the Book of Mormon, do we really need to believe that everything in the Book of Mormon is a historical, is a literal historical fact? That's not found in the Church Handbook of Instructions, and it's not a doctrine. <laughs> okay, I, I was stunned by this, that apparently the sine qua non of establishing whether something is doctrine is actually not the scriptures, it's not what the apostles say, it's whether it's in the church handbook of instructions. Were you surprised by that at all, Tyler? I, I So much so I didn't know what to say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just barely said that it's about the first pregnancy statements and the doctrines found in the scriptures and it's it, it's in these areas um and but but the handbook bringing up which i'm like this is a, i thought this was a policy not doctrine you know so we're conflating some things here so that, that's why my remark was is i'll continue <laughs> well that's true i mean there is no temple recommend that says do you believe the book of mormon is a literal history right i sorry i, I did want to come in um if um 
I think it, it was Mormonism Live. I think one of the earlier episodes, actually, that uh, RFM and Bill Real went over how the church handbook of instruction really is becoming a scripture reference. And that that is what is used to determine policy and doctrine these days. And it is not written necessarily by the apostles and the prophets of the church, but also, you know, overrun by committees and lawyers, etc. So, um, yeah, so to me, this was kind of like a callback to what we already learned uh, in those episodes and just even just how the church handbook of instructions is getting quoted more in general conference. I did want to just like go back to the assertion that people can learn more about Jesus Christ in the Book of Mormon uh, than in the Bible. And I just had to have to say a strong disagree there. Um, it's it's all there's way more in the New Testament gospels about Jesus Christ than I think anything really all that unique in the Book of Mormon, other than maybe adding to his story that, you know, that he came here doctrinally or as far as his character goes, I, I don't really see hardly anything, honestly, but just a professed belief in him. So. Good point. Uh, Tyler. I, I just wanted to push back on that a little bit um, j just because it depends on your definition of God your definition of Christ. And if you want to learn about the Mormon Christ, the LDS Christ, you do the best by reading the Book of Mormon. Um, and and because the Book of Mormon has, you know, 35 chapter 9, for example, we learn about that's Christ, not the Old Testament God, for example. Um, you you have, and then there are some pretty powerful, you know, verses, that Alma chapter 7, 11, you know, some pretty cool verses that... Um, you know, some people could argue, uh, bring uh, a new insight to to Jesus Christ that you don't necessarily get from the Bible. Um, that's kind of a subjective thing. And then let's not forget, though, that uh, statistically speaking, uh, the words of Christ show up a lot more in the Book of Mormon than they do in the Bible. And so there but is, is that true in the New Testament? Uh I think so. In fact, I, I, I actually have the statistics in my scriptures. I'll, I'll look at it in just a minute. But yeah, I was I was sort of uh, looking at that. What was it back in the late 1980s when they were doing those statistical analyses and figuring out that apparently the book that says Jesus the most is the truest? <laughs> something I yeah, something like this. I'm looking for whether I have on the front cover. But 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 anyway, I'm just saying that mentions of Jesus. I, I To me, that doesn't really amount too much no i can come we're up with my own book we're on a subjective interpretation and that's why i wanted to push back because there are many members who will tell you that the book of mormon is what brought them to christ and learned christ through the book of mormon and that's their experience and i've had s some powerful experiences with the book of mormon that i did not have from the bible but i could also talk about certain experiences with the bible both ways i'm just i'm just saying it, it's it. subjective is all. I made a pretty sweeping statement there. So, um, yeah. yeah. Well, if I wrote a 500-page book that every line just said, all work and no play makes Jesus a dull boy, I think I could beat all of them put together. <laughs> there you go. Where were we in this transcript? Um, Last sentence. No. Yeah. Oh, right. Right here. Is it my turn? I actually don't remember who was going. Yeah, Tyler just said that's not. No, Tyler just said, haha, well, that's true. I mean, there's no temple recommend question that says, do you believe the Book of Mormon is a literal history? All right. And I'm Bednar. I've really forgotten already. Yes. <laughs> I guess so. Okay. Right. The doctrines and teachings we need to believe are in the church handbook of instructions. Uh, just a quick statement. He says something to that effect. This is one of the few areas I couldn't recall exactly, but he brought up the church handbook instructions again about what we to believe or something. It does sound like he's making room for people to be non-literal believers in the Book of Mormon. Uh, yeah, I kind of, I kind of, um, and again, I, I don't know how he could respond differently because again, I was kind of priming, leading the question, so to speak, by being like, hey, this is where I'm at. Why is it even a problem? I, I can't imagine if it was a problem for for an apostle to to say, "Yeah, you don't have the faith," you know, get get in line or something, right? So, so even if it was a requirement to truly believe it literally, I, I think he he probably would not have said that. 
because he would assume that if I did study the Book of Mormon more or anybody who does, they would they would gain a testimony of that's a literal historicity itself. Um, however, he didn't give any indication that it's really that important. In fact, he, he kept on going back to, you know, the handbook of instructions and, and, and this type of thing. Um, and, and the historicity, like the church essay says, it's really not so important. It's just the, the lessons that we glean as other, as president Nelson said recently, right. That it's not a historical textbook. Right. Okay. I think Peter has no problem pushing back against things that he does not like and he disagrees with. So I, um, yeah. So I, I think he could if if he did, but I maybe going with what you said, maybe it's just really not important enough to him to really register as like uh, an irritation or something that he feels compelled to correct. And uh, you know, if he doesn't agree with that, right? Just like, yeah, just trying to look at maybe other perspectives as I was there. <laughs> Um, okay, in fact, I say perspective. Next line. Uh, sometimes it can be hard at church when members aren't accepting of other perspectives. Yes, but don't allow the weaknesses of imperfect people, of members, to stand in the way of the gospel and the path to Christ. It's always the members, folks. Yes. And this was a big one for me because, I mean, and this is what upset me the most when people left the church. And I actually, I think maybe the thing that I maybe judged them the most harshly for was because I really didn't think uh, with historical issues or with, especially with interpersonal issues, because there's a real stigma of like getting offended, you know, by members uh, and, and leaving because of anything that any person has done. It's just, you know, you're just already, the judgments are so huge there, but especially towards the end of it, I was really focusing a lot more on Jesus, which is kind of one of like the baby steps to be kind of one foot out the door almost, whether you realize it or not. And so that's what I felt like members leaving the ones that I thought had a testimony at one point, that was the big betrayal to me. Um, and that, you know, that they're, they're giving up the greatest thing, you know, for pottage. It is funny what you said, though, that uh, focusing on Jesus is the first step out of the church. For some, it's a, it's kind of a half step. I, I've just seen it be a, a part of a lot of people's journeys out. They're starting to realize that something is wrong, I think, and they're looking for more meaning. And they're looking for, I think, um, not just some... meaning, but the kindness and the, the, the New Testament Jesus and the humanity that he showed um i think they're starting those members are starting to feel the weight of i guess the pharisaism that's that's in the church very obviously so that's that's just my two cents on on why i think that um and we're yeah. to tyler's line now yep yeah. um <laughs> yes which i think is very helpful that church which i think is very helpful that the church published the essays on areas like the translation and the book of Abraham. I mean, now we can still have faith that it is scripture while also recognizing that it was not a literal translation. The, uh, uh, that the LDS and non-LDS Egyptologists agree that the facsimiles do not match the, what Joseph Smith said it did. It gives us important insights into what Joseph Smith meant by translation. You are asking such loaded questions, it's hard for me not to laugh out loud. Were you having any trouble keeping a straight face? I, no, I was having a struggle. Uh, framing my questions in, in, in a way that I could actually get a response from him instead of making a feel uncomfortable. I'm just trying to, um, you know, bombard him with a bunch of, you know, critical things or something. But, but in, in this case, yeah, I just, I wanted him to know that I was grateful for the, at these essays so that um, you, because before that you couldn't, you couldn't sh share that with anybody from the church website and say, look, you know, um, it's not a true translation. They just think you're just full of the anti-Mormon devil or something, and it can be very hurtful. But to now say, no, the church accepts this, and you and, and you can still accept the book of Abraham to be scripture um, with, without it being a literal um, translation. Um, you, you have to just change a perspective, but, but they're not always mutually exclusive, for example. And I was trying to get that point across. Well, I think you're killing him with kindness. <laughs> Yeah, I, I want to say, I think most of the time in most of the circles that I, I'm talking about people or about this kind of stuff with people is usually with 
members who are already out or halfway out, um, or the physically and mentally out. And so we are able to be more blunt and I guess yeah, blunt and more honest with these kinds of questions. And so I think if I had to like in the moment without preparation, try to be bringing up these things and asking questions in such a gentle way without coming across as antagonistic, I would not have been able to do that. And so I, like I said it at the beginning, I will say it again, there were, this was like another part as I'm reading this that I just think there's very few people who could have done uh, what you've done here, Tyler, to be able to do that on the fly. Um, and then I, I just feel like, I mean, no conversation is perfect, but this is a pretty good flow, you know, from Book of Mormon, historicity like into book of abraham which is there's a much stronger case for that one that it's not literal it's not historical you know that was a really great transition so i really with no preparation on your part i'm just so impressed with how this went well he was guided by the holy ghost definitely and i'm talking you were being led by the spirit <laughs> and i'm talking about tyler not so much elder bednar necessarily because next he sort I, he seems to retreat into bumper sticker slogans so as to not have to deal with the issues you're actually bringing up in your question. And that's your your line again now for Elder Bednar, yeah. Raven? He didn't describe the details of translation when he was asked about it. What we have is the scripture he produced, and the Book of Mormon is Testament of Christ. And then we get into the second anointing. Oh, my gosh. The, the second anointing? <laughs> you're talking to a guy who received it. Yeah. Along with the lady who's immediately on his right and probably the guy who's immediately on her right. Yeah, I did not belong in that circle. What um, possessed you? <laughs> but but maybe I want to say thank you for, for saying that. It was hard. Elder Bednar's um, additional pauses and everything, it, it, it made it hard. I felt very tripped up on my words. Um, you know, I've I spoken to large crowds and things before and some of my conferences I've, I've done and this was very hard for me to just stay focused and just keep on, on uh, going on that track and so i i'm glad that you can see the struggle that i went through and the perseverance that i had to have i know for a fact i could not have done this oh you could have with god's help you can do all things that's right that's like uh i don't know philippians four thirteen or something anyway nobody checked me on that so, uh, no, can I read my gut reactions to this section? Because I was just looking at them. I think it's pretty good. It won't take too long. Here's what I said. This statement, and this is specifically the one about um, other Christians might study the Bible, but they will never learn as much about Christ as you can for the Book of Mormon. This statement seems so myopic. I think the most charitable interpretation is that Elder Bednar has no idea what other Christians learn about Jesus from studying the Bible. And... How can Mormons learn more about Jesus from studying the Book of Mormon if apostles aren't even sure what the interpretation is? And if this part about skin changing color is literally true, what is its readers, the readers of the Book of Mormon, what are they learning about Jesus? Maybe it is something more than what we would learn from the Bible, but that doesn't necessarily make it a good thing. And if it isn't literally true, then what else in the Book of Mormon might not be literally true? And how does that help readers know more about Jesus? When you can't know which ones to believe literally and which not, which is the same problem. I mean, the Bible has now, to be perfectly honest, and this is what Christians are struggling with, you know, which verses to take metaphorically and which ones to take literally. Yes. I, I think part of Elder Bednar's position, though, is reading the Book of Mormon. No, nobody can read the Book of Mormon honestly without, without the accompanying of the Spirit testifying that the words are true. And you get that stronger than you would from reading the Bible. And that is... A, a teaching that is often given. You know, you, you can't even say the Book of Mormon or the name of the church without the Spirit giving its witness that it's true. And and so by that conclusion, that is uh, what he's getting at, I think, also. Okay. I mean, Sorry, that's I, a good point, I, but it's a point. 
right. <laughs> it's it's perspective, right. I mean, that's right. right. Anyway. I just want to share a real quick story from my mission. We, my companion and I were teaching a woman who had some familiarity with the church. She was Polynesian. So she, she seemed like really golden. She just didn't have a testimony of the Book of Mormon. And so when we were doing our daily planning and planning our lesson for that day uh, for her, my companion and I decided that, you know, we should like really put it to the test right there with her. Like we would ask her to pray. We were going to read some scriptures. We carefully selected them out and we were going to ask her to pray and ask God if it was not true. And so we, we did that. We even all, like we all three knelt on the floor. She said a prayer asking God to let her know if the, if, if it was true or not. And, and we waited and I started to feel the spirit really strongly. I felt like a burning in the bosom. And I almost thought like, I think maybe I should say something. Cause I, I, again, I, I'm totally into this. I think this is really real. So obviously if I'm feeling it, um, it's the Holy ghost. It's not something generated within me. So she has to be feeling it, but I didn't, I was waiting for her to kind of say something. And so, I mean, and at this point I was really patient because the, the waiting and the silence, it's not always a manipulative tactic. It's a great one for teaching. It's, it's actually like, I think one of the best ones I've ever, I, like I use the most. And this was also something we did as a missionary. So we were just waiting and I just thought for sure she was going to say, I, I feel it, but she didn't after a while, like when she felt awkward enough, she just said like, I don't feel it. And I just remember just feeling like a, def a deflated balloon and feeling so crushed because I really felt that I had felt it strongly. And so I felt like it was testifying, you know, and this was a problem though. I believed she was sincerely asking. And so I couldn't kind of fall back on the, well, I felt it. So if she didn't feel it, then I know she wasn't sincere. I couldn't, I couldn't say that with myself. But when I when we left, um, we asked her to just maybe read some more and pray again. Like we were not expecting that outcome genuinely. Like I really had full faith that this was going to like there was going to be a revelation for her that day. So it's a very different experience um, than what you had either with yours. But which just kind of goes to show how subjective it could be. But my companion also said she felt the spirit. So the two of us did. But the investigator didn't. Well, that seems like a waste. Yeah. That was a struggle for me, really, to to try to figure that one out. So, anyway, we ready to move on? <laughs> yeah, second anointing. I can't believe. Oh, that's a small section, at least, though. Yeah. So, do I? I'll do Elder Bednar on this one, okay? Yeah, I could tell when I was talking to him, he didn't want to talk about this in much detail. So I. Yeah, yeah. you started off by saying Elder Bednar. So tell me about your second anointing. And <clears throat> I said. Uh, yeah, the Book of Mormon is very power is a very powerful book, and one can easily feel the spirit when you read it. Prior to my mission, I was perhaps obsessed with confirmations of the spirit and well seeking to make my calling and election sure. At that time, the way I understood it that it would happen is that uh, once I proved myself righteous and faithful enough that Jesus would appear to me and tell me that I had made it, then Jesus would appear to the prophet and tell him that he told me. The prophet would then call me in, in and give me the second anointing. Of course, I, I understand it works differently than that now, but uh, well, at the time, that was my my impression. I'm going to stare at you and pierce right to your soul while I don't say anything for about 10 seconds. Then Elder <laughs> Bednar says, <laughs> yeah, man, I'm going to kill you. No, he says, uh, yes, well, I'll say this. If someone is focused on that goal, then they most likely aren't going to get it period end of statement by elder bednar end of that section on the second anointing can i share with you my thoughts they're not that many but the thoughts that came to me was this sounds a bit supercilious coming from a guy who has already received his second anointing it's like he's putting you down for trying to get the second anointing and i also note that he tacitly agrees with you by the way, somewhat important about the existence of the second anointing, because he doesn't challenge that. I think that most people who have studied this issue and listened to this podcast or other podcasts recognize that there really is Virginia, a second anointing, but he's tacitly admitting it as well. He only challenges the way of obtaining it, whether if you're focused on it, you're probably not going to get it. And how does what Elder Bednar said about not being focused on it as a goal compare with what Joseph Smith said on the subject, which I looked up 
and quoted from Teachings of the Prophet, Joseph Smith, page 299, where Joseph Smith said, I would exhort you to go on and continue to call upon God until you make your calling and election sure for yourselves by obtaining this more sure word of prophecy and wait patiently for the promise until you obtain it. It sounds like Joseph Smith was encouraging something different. He was encouraging members to focus on it a great deal. And now Elder Bednar saying, yeah, if you focus on it, you're probably not going to get it. Yeah, why would you not want to? It, it, there's just so many righteous desires, I guess, that people can have. But I, I, in a way, it's, I mean, there is this idea that you shouldn't ever be looking for anything. And so I do feel like this is a uh, common criticism. I think among priesthood in general, like there's this an idea, I think you guys do, like this guy's trying to move up, you know, and um, and then of course, as a woman, anytime you're bringing up the sexism or the fact that the women don't have the priesthood or have any leadership, it, it's often treated that way as well as if we're seeking, uh, you know, the honor of it, you know, instead of thinking, I mean, like this really started to become a problem for me as a missionary because when I have a convert, like the other, the elders could baptize theirs, but I couldn't baptize mine. And I, I just, I just couldn't help but wonder why not. And so anyway, it's just amazing that something can be so easily twisted when it's on the one hand, when they want to talk about it as this like amazing you know, power of God to do ordinances, sealing ordinances, essential ordinances for salvation. But when a woman wants to do it, then it's just like, ah, you're just, you know, you're just wanting it for vanity or whatever. Like you should be fine not ever having it. And so to kind of do that with the second anointing, like the second anointing means you've, you've made it. You're that dedicated to God that you've been selected out. You're absolutely right. And I hear everything you're saying. I just want to add that um, the, the overall context of, the, of this, of course, is that even though you, I, and Tyler and everybody listening into this program is in the know, we're not supposed to know about the existence of the second anointing. More than the general one that a lot of us did have. Do you mean the first anointing? I mean, no, like the, the general idea, I think, Tyler, you were kind of alluding to, like there's this, I, I, we hear about it. We think it's something that kind of individually happens that like maybe God would tell us. That that was what I thought, that yeah. if I lived my life righteous enough, maybe some time towards the end before I died, I, I would have some kind of really amazing uh, spiritual experience where God basically lets me know I've made it and I can relax and die happy, I guess, you know, but that's not what it is. So yeah. You know, well, you know, I, this was very interesting. I, I have I had a couple of impressions when I was talking to Elder Bedinar, and it might surprise you what uh, those impressions were. And they could be completely wrong. But just watching his eyes, his body language and and the sensations, the feelings, I felt that the problem that I had when explaining this and there was more that I said than just this. It's just my recollection, the summary of it. The problem was not that I was seeking the second anointing, because that's something that can be done. That's something if you are true and faithful to the church, to the commandments, you prove yourself loyal, faithful, and so on, you can have that. If that's really what you want, you can get that. The issue, and this is when it, this is, this is just my impression is when I started talking about, I would see the savior, that he would appear uh, to me and tell me I am saved. And then he would tell the prophet. And that's why I'm saying, oh, I understand things work differently because I no longer believe that all the apostles have seen Jesus Christ, for example. And I could tell that bothered him that I was at the time seeking to see Jesus Christ. And so that's what I felt like he almost had a bigger problem with that I would get my own witness in, in terms of actually seeing Jesus Christ, something that I feel they haven't done. And, and, and yet Denver Schnuffer and others have, you know, uh, proclaimed that they have, and that could be very problematic. And so it's, it's more, that was more the problem that I was, that I was be seeking after Jesus Christ and have a physical manifestation and appearance of him and telling me I'm saved. That was the issue because the second anointing, that's something that we can have. All of us can have that in this life if you, you know, there, there's a protocol that if you follow and so on, which has been discussed. But 
Um, I, I, I just, I thought that, that was interesting. And that's why I actually go to the next section talking about special witnesses, because that's when I felt like in the earlier conversation here to kind of tip this hand about this idea of seeing Jesus Christ. And that's why I went into this conversation. And this is one of my favorite sections. Well, I, sorry, I have stuff okay, to say. Maven. <laughs> I, what you just said is just really interesting to me. Um, because if you are sensing that correctly, I can I can get why that would maybe bother him. And I, I guess I have a few different thoughts. I, like you said, the, the whole Denver stuffer thing um, or the, the idea of basically becoming your own prophet and going off, you know, if you do come to believe that you've had that. Um, also, maybe a part of him knowing that he hasn't. Um, but also... Um, that, just, that goes along with what I was just saying about righteous desires, like shouldn't make prophets and apostles upset. And I think it's just fascinating that an apostle, like a witness for Jesus Christ, would be upset at the idea of a member having a very strong experience with Christ. So it, it, it kind of, it really just falls in line with what other Christians say about us is that like these men really do put themselves in between it's more so the prophet. But I feel like this is almost what's happening here that you, you are not below him. He's up here. You're, you know, and so, so for you to have that experience would be something more that he's had as an apostle, but um, yeah, it's just really fascinating. Um, and then also, I mean, it's the same experience that joseph smith had at least in one of his visions so like it's the whole like it was it was great for joseph smith to ask a question as a boy but don't you guys ask questions and you women stop asking about heavenly mother we don't know you know it's not fair for us to demand stuff from god anyway we can move on to that that was just really interesting thanks for sharing that tyler yeah thank you maven <clears throat> um so I said, uh, yes, that makes sense. I, and I see that now, but uh, it did get me interested in spiritual confirmations. It was, it was really helpful to me and others when Elder Oaks made the comment that he has never had an Alma the Younger or angelic-like experience, but that he gained his testimony and faith in the same way that everyone else does. Remember, oh, go ahead. <laughs> that was me giving you your cue. Oh, okay. Yeah. Remember, Alma didn't gain his testimony by having an angel appear to him. Right. It says he prayed and fasted many days that he might know of these things for himself. First, let's not forget that Alma was a very wicked teenager. If an angel never came and hit him upside the head, he may well not have changed. Oh, that, that's a good point. I mean, although Laman and Lemuel saw an angel, they, they didn't convert. That was a good point. I think Almost every member would have thought of that immediately of Laman and Lemuel. So, yeah, and I, 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 I almost had a, a disconnect here when he said that because if if that's what it took, then why doesn't God hit every teenager upside the head and they can all have that Alma the younger experience and then they can all decide whether or not to pray and decide what to go because he, he, the impression was he was saying that had that not have happened then Alma would have continued being a wicked teenager because he would not have been able to find the enticements of the spirit strong enough to get him back to the good side, so to speak. So I, I felt that, I, I see what he was saying, but I felt that was kind of problematic, though. A strange thing to say, for sure. Yeah. And it's also like something they level at, at those who leave, you know, because we don't want to know, right, um, that even an angel wouldn't help us. So interesting. And what I... I'm sorry. What I sense here is a uh, a, diminution, a diminution or he's taking the experience of having an angel appear to you and sort of poo-pooing it, that it's not important. And it's sort of like, you know, if I haven't had an angel appear to me, then it can't be that important. Yeah, I think we see that as it comes out more in this. Okay. Where are we? Um. I think Bednar, it, Elder it Bednar. Oh, it's is it still me? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, they didn't oh. follow. Okay, they didn't follow the same path that Alma did. Right, which which is again the importance of continued small spiritual confirmations, which is why I think what Elder Oak said was helpful. I mean, he hasn't had any major spiritual vi visitation as an apostle yet, remains strong and faithful. That was so brave to say. <laughs> 
That's amazing. Sorry. Um, uh, yes, the spirit testifies and confirms the truth through our feelings more than a physical experience. Right. I mean, I think it was uh, President Grant who said that he had never seen the Savior, and he doesn't know anybody who has. Yet it is interesting, many members think that all, or at least some, of the apostles have literally seen Christ. Um, this, is my, this is my parenthetical remark. He didn't respond. He just shakes his head in agreement and says something. He did say something. He was, you know, about, again, maybe witness from the, from the Spirit is the confirmation or something like this. Um, so, so I continued to press a little bit more on this. I said, so why, why do you think it is that so many members are under this impression? I mean, some members will even testify that, of course, they have seen Christ because they are, quote, special witnesses of Christ. Um, sorry. <laughs> That's the problem and misunderstanding right there. We are not special witnesses of Christ. We are special witnesses of of the name of Christ. That was another talking thing to me. Um, Cause I just don't think, I mean, again, we're just, we're playing really with semantic games here with just like little tiny words and you know, where they're placed. Um, it actually reminds me of, of the office, um, the, the ongoing joke about assistant manager and assistant to the manager. That's this kind of distinction here. And when I was serving as a missionary, there was a, a DVD that they were pushing pretty hard that I'm pretty sure the title of it was Special Witnesses of Christ. Um, it was not Special Witnesses of the Name of Christ. I'm 100% sure on that. So, Yeah, I remember that DVD. We, we use that often. Is that the one that came out in the year 2000? Mm. Somewhere around mind. there. Yeah, I mean... It, Maybe later than that, a little bit later than that. I feel like because I served in 2008 and I felt like it was still pretty new-ish, not brand, brand new, but yeah, somewhere around there. Anyway, um, so, okay, I got That's why I said, right, that's a good point. I know Elder Oaks has also talked about that. Uh, yes, he's been talking about that for a long time. We are special witnesses of the name of Christ, and we have been given special authority and keys to do that. Mm, that makes sense. Yet, uh, still, we have many members who hear or read things like from what Elder McConkie or President Packer have said to mean that they have seen Christ. Um, members will, will interpret uh, our words to mean what they want them to mean, but we are special witnesses to the name of Christ and have been given authority and keys as such. Did he repeat himself or did I just repeat a line? No, that's what he said. Okay. Yeah. Just really wants to hit that authority and the keys and not anybody else. <laughs> Even if you see Jesus, you don't have the authority and keys that I do. <gasps> yes. I mean, it's, it's not like, and this is a funny part. Cause I was like, I, I was like, yeah, I mean, it's not like you were, I was talking to him as an apostle, right? It's not like you were ordained an apostle. And then right after that, Christ appeared to you. <laughs> I can imagine. However, that if, if you were, if that, if you were under that strong belief since primary that the apostles have, seen Christ, and, and now you are an apostle and still haven't seen Christ, you'd be like, oh, what, what do I need to do? He, right here, he kind of chuckled, you know, he didn't really say anything. So I continued. It's like the inside joke about the recently called junior apostle. He looks around the room, wondering if he is the only one who hasn't seen him. Did he laugh at that joke? Yes, I have a ha ha. Oh, well, good. I think he might have experienced it himself as well. Um. All right, so he says, ha ha, <laughs> no, uh, that's certainly not something that uh, that we even worry about or occupies our time. Yes, it makes sense. I, as, as many, he didn't think it was that funny, but he had to laugh because I was so interactive into that, right? Um, but, but I say, yeah, it makes sense. As, as many members think that the apostles have had the same experience as Joe Smith with the first vision, which itself is an interesting with the different accounts. Okay, so can we go back up to the part that really surprised me about this one, which is when he says, members will interpret our words to mean what they want them to mean, right? So in other words, the whole thing that he's saying is that members have this idea that they see that apostles have seen Jesus because they've misinterpreted the apostles' words. This isn't a message that the apostles have tried to get across somehow even though the apostles have never indicated at all 
that they've seen Jesus. All these thousands, if not millions of members believe they have for some inexplicable reason. They've all come to this irrational conclusion on their own. It's like mass uh, hypnosis. And, you know, this is just so ridiculous to me. I did a podcast uh, some time ago about have LDS apostles seen Jesus, which where I canvass the issue. And I show that in all these correlated manuals that are, you know, sanctioned by the LDS church and its leaders, they are trying to push the idea that apostles have seen Jesus. And, and we actually have a couple of examples that are recent from Elder Cook. I know I used to go to general conference and I would, I would wait till the end. I'd actually have to kind of endure the talks to get to the end where I was really excited to see how hard this particular apostle was going to indicate that they had really seen Jesus without coming out and say it, saying it to, to Elder Bednar's credit. He is not trying to give you an indication that he or the other apostles have seen Jesus to his credit. I think he's basically saying that the other apostles haven't seen Jesus either. He's not trying to say, well, some of them, maybe they have, but I feel like he's speaking for them as well as himself on this when he says that members have misinterpreted what we, our words, right, as apostles. The thought did come to me that if you just said we haven't seen Jesus, it's hard to misinterpret that, but apparently they're not going to go there. And yet we have a certain apostle. Oh, and I also want to give Elder Bednar credit for the fact that I do not think, I cannot recall him as being one of the apostles who have played this word game, this particular word game about trying to indicate they've seen Jesus without coming out and saying it. And I think anybody who's been a Mormon more than five minutes knows what I'm talking about. But there is an apostle well, who has just, just just real quick. Oh, that's an important thing that you said about giving Elder Bednar credit about this. I just two things. One, if you just read the transcript on its own, you'll also notice he didn't ever say that he or or that he has never seen Christ or that none of the apostles seen Christ. However, um my impression with his gestures with his laugh with his there wasn't actually even as much silence during during some of this other area he, he was he was more con more, just more transparent to me I, I i i left this conversation because it was as clear as clear can be that he had never seen jesus christ and he has talked openly with other brethren this is my impression Enough that he feels comfortable speaking it for their behalf, at least once he's talked to. You know, I mean, President Packer, maybe or Elder McConkie, you know, those were older, but just that he feels comfortable enough speaking for them. And it wasn't until I look look back at what he actually said, because um, a lot of these really are pretty direct quotes, that I realized he didn't actually say that he has never seen or the apostles have never seen. But no, at, no. At, oh. Right, but at the time, I felt that that was so that was, that was so clear that I, I didn't need to bring it up anymore. Well, it's very clear to me. He doesn't have to say we've never seen it. If you say these members believe that they've seen Jesus, and he says, well, that's because they're misinterpreting what we say. Well, he didn't. He didn't say that. He just says members are going to interpret what they mean. And so you could have somebody else say, RFM, you you right now are just interpreting. His words to me, he hasn't seen Christ. Yes, and well, that's the and correct interpretation. To interpret his words to mean that he still has seen Christ. Yeah, it's getting harder though. I think to say because when he says members will interpret our words to mean what they want them to mean, but we are special witnesses to the name of Christ. Yes, he did have that, so that's that's when I, at, at the time that gave me such clarity what he was saying. So that's why I'm just trying to emphasize. At the time, it was very clear, and that's why I moved on. I didn't push the issue further. But if I look at this transcript as a TBM, so to speak, and look to see maybe there's a wiggle room, I can find it. Oh, you can always find it if you're motivated mm -hmm. enough. That's what my time as an apologist taught me. By the way, though, we've got some special appearances on the program by right. Elder Quentin L. Cook. Known to his friends as Quentin L. Crook, but that's rude. And I would encourage people not to call him that because he's not a crook.
This is Quentin L. Cook. But this appears to be, he appears to really have picked up on this now. And he wants, this is a shtick to try and get people to believe he's seen Jesus. Okay. And we have a couple of oh, quotes from him. Okay. One is from January of this year. This is recent, 2012. And the second one is from a different appearance four years ago in 2018 before a different group. If they sound similar, it's not your imagination. Do we have the first clip of that? By the way, this is going to be speeded up a little bit so we can get out of here before midnight. <laughs> now, I have tried to figure out uh, how I can uh, testify as an apostle of sacred spiritual experiences that doesn't reveal them, which I we know we're not supposed to do. Uh, we try and keep those things that are very special and unusual, sacred and, and appropriate so that the Lord can trust us and we can receive additional guidance and direction. But I want you to listen carefully because I, I feel it's very important to bear an apostolic witness of sacred things that I have experienced in my own way. I solemnly testify to you as an apostle that I know the Savior's voice and I know the Savior's face. I leave an apostolic witness with you that he lives that he's divine, that he guides his church, that he guides his prophet. I leave that witness with you. So Tyler, am I misinterpreting Elder Cook's words? Because I'm getting the impression he's indicating he's seen Jesus. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's difficult because that seems to be very, very clear of what he is saying. And it makes me feel uncomfortable because Maybe he has seen an experience. A person I don't believe the Denver Snuffer has seen Jesus Christ. Oh, but I Elder believe, Cook has? But I, I'm just saying, I believe Denver Snuffer has seen something that has some very strong experiences. I've had experiences. I've had dreams. I've had things that I can't necessarily explain. And so I'm just saying, Elder Cook, I I want to believe he's an, he's an honest man, not, you know, the attorney stuff he does the hospitals or something we don't need to get into that but you know i i'm just saying i i think that that this could be a deeply a sincere belief or something but it something about it also makes me feel uncomfortable because i feel like he is saying something that is misleading that is that is stronger than than the facts are and he knows exactly what he's doing i'm not denying that he's had a strong spiritual experience I think Denver Schneffer has, and many others have also, but there's just something about it that, that makes me feel uncomfortable um, be, because I guess deep down, I, I want to believe that he has literally physically seen Jesus Christ, that he knows his face just like he says he has. But when it comes down to the evidence and different things, that's obviously not what's going on. And well, Tyler, you're going to have to be prepared to be feeling comfortable, even more uncomfortable, because we've got the same kind of thing from the same apostle in 2018. By the way, this is not said in general conference by Elder Cook. These are regional uh, meetings or presentations that he is uh, giving this at, which really aren't supposed to be recorded, but we got them, so we're going to play them. I'm going to jump in real quick. I think the uncomfortable feeling is... And I think especially those of us who have served missions know, like we know we're supposed to testify and we're told to testify sometimes, even if we're not feeling it. And so I think when you're, when you're doing that and you're saying, I know, I, I just think, I, I think that's um, an experience most of us understand, like what, what it is that you're talking about that is making you feel uncomfortable. That's all. He is to be a witness of Jesus Christ. And the reason I've gone through this with you is I want to bear a simple witness to you that I hope you'll remember because it's a true witness and I'm going to say it in a way that I'm hopeful that you'll remember it very well. I had had experiences that were a very spiritual nature before that and I've had them even more so since being called to the twelve. I know, having worked on Preach My Gospel, and many of you are missionaries that have had Preach My Gospel, that we don't share sacred experiences. We don't share the details of them. The Lord can't trust us. We do. And so I've determined that I would bear this with 
this in a way that would be significant to you but wouldn't violate any of the trust that I've received. So I simply want to witness to you that I know the Savior's voice and I know the Savior's face. I'm a sure witness of the divinity of Jesus Christ. Nothing about the name of Jesus there, huh? Were you continuing to feel uncomfortable, Tyler? You know, I, I actually had maybe an insight. Maybe he has not seen Jesus Christ. And yet he feels so strongly that Christ does live and that he's a witness of him. And it would be a violation of him to outright bold-faced lie and directly say, I have seen Jesus Christ face to face as a man speaking unto a friend. Well, Exodus 33, by the way. Um, you know, it, it would, that would be a bold-faced lie for him to say that. And that would violate the trust that he feels he has with God. That would, that would go against his ethics and morals. So, so he'll just deceive. It, it, yeah, because it's, because it's a bold, direct deceiving. However, if he can word it in such a way where there's the, the plausibility, I didn't actually say I saw him. I just insinuated. They're, they're interpreted that way. That allows him to maintain his moral agency, however he's decided to interpret that. Um, maybe that's actually what he's really tipping his hand at. Maven, what do you think about this? I don't know. I know you've done episodes before about lying for the Lord. And I do feel that as, um, like as a believer and as a missionary, I really, I really did believe in Jesus a lot. I just, I feel like sometimes I might've overplayed my hand sometimes, but I also felt it was okay because it was about Jesus, you know? And I, I honestly felt like even if, um, I wasn't feeling as strongly as something that I was saying, you know, or testifying of, I still felt that it was true. And so that the spirit could still maybe like testify it to somebody else. Um, so I, I was iffy with this and I, in a way, I, I not quite that bold faced. I would not have said like that I, Jesus, but I really felt that I did know him, you know, and I, I, I think we're giving him a, a little too much credit, though. I, to be honest, it's a bit much for me. <laughs> okay, without saying he's a liar, all right? He's he's trying to deceive his audience. And what he's trying to do, by the way, trying to deceive somebody without technically lying is much more difficult to do. It requires a lot more thought. It requires a lot more planning and premeditation to equivocate on something, to say something that's technically true I don't even, th I think he's gone beyond that line, actually, unless he's talking about looking at the cover of the Enzyme magazine so he, kn he knows the Savior's face, right? But, and heard his voice, unless he's talking about the scriptures and, you know, the Doctrine and Covenants, right, Tyler, where it says, if you read these these revelations, then you've heard my voice, even though, you know, I'm reading them. Radio Free Mormon could read them and you're hearing God's voice. So if, unless you get some kind of metaphysical kind of interpretation, but seeing his face, no, you have gone too far as far as I'm concerned. And that's where he goes over the line, not just from deceiving, but to actually prevaricating. And hopefully well, he they says, will... I know yes. his face. Yeah. I, he didn't say, I have seen his face. So how does he know his face if he hasn't seen it? Well, the, right, Jesus that, that, so that allows Jesus. subjective interpretation, right? I can't yeah. say I know your face if I haven't seen it. Uh, well, I think, RFM, you have been apologist for how long? I'm pretty sure you could come up with an explanation of why somebody could say, I know their face, even though they haven't seen it. Besides, no. we, and, and, and let's not forget that an eyewitness account is the, is the, is the least, uh, you know, uh, as the lowest tier of evidence that there is, you know? Oh, I don't believe that's true. Well, in, in terms of, in terms of, you know, DNA, forensic evidence, this is what I'm talking about, right? I'm saying an eyewitness account. Yeah. It's, 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 we use it more than we should. And I'll, I'll, I, I think it's interesting with, that he's making this, this strong statements that is directly insinuating that he has seen Christ, but he is not directly saying it, which, which allows him to feel comfortable that he is not actually lying 
He's not directly lying. Because here's the real rub. What experience can he possibly what experience can he possibly have <laughs> where uh, where it would be too sacred to share? For, when we look at Joe Smith, I saw Jesus Christ, right? I I I DC 76, you know, 23, you know, I, I you know I, I saw him on the right hand of God. Behold, that they are the world's are worked by him. You know, I, it is very clear, very direct. You, you, I mean, you can't even fathom an experience that possibly, he, you know, is greater than than that. You can't just say what the facts are, right? Right. So we're agreeing then at a minimum that he's uh, using language intentionally to give a false impression to his audience because he doesn't want to lie. Well, I think it's because he does want to lie without getting caught in it. In other words, he has his he has his way to backtrack. He's trying to get people to believe he's seen he's seen Jesus because I know his face. I know his voice and all the artful language all around it. Right. Always preceded by it. we're told we're not supposed to share our most sacred experiences because then Jesus can't trust us, you know, because every time Jesus shows up, he says, hey, don't tell anybody I was here. Right. So. Right. That was going to be something I was going to say. I, I could understand. I, I understand that there can be very spiritual, like very personal spiritual experiences. The whole pearls before swine thing that you wouldn't want to share with people. But when your calling is to be a witness for Christ, this seems like an exception to me. This seems like exactly the kind of thing that you should be sharing. So it's an odd one. God is just so weird sometimes. Can I make the two, I'm sorry. Can I make the two main points from this? I know we got into a bit of an argument here or at least a discussion. But uh, the two main points are we have Elder Bednar indicating that none of the apostles have seen Jesus. It's just people misinterpreting their words. Juxtaposed with these two statements by Elder Cook, which I think shows that the fault, dear Brutus, lies not in the member's interpretation, but in the leader's words, that the members believe they've seen Jesus. Okay, that's number one. And number two, if I can remember it, is that um, if Elder Bednar is saying that, then why is, if Elder Bednar is saying that the other apostles, including Elder Cook, have not seen Jesus, then why is he trying to suggest that he is? Those are the questions that I have. Yeah. And right now, actually, it's getting late. And I don't know how much more is there of this. I'm going to try and stop uh, interrupting, okay? So we can get through this at a decent hour. And while we're going back, I just wanted to say, too, that it's interesting, but if we, it's almost hurts your testimony more if you believe that they actually have seen Jesus Christ. Because if, if the veil is that thin and they're having a one-on-one -on -one communion with Christ Thursday at the temple, right? On then, the fourth floor. Uh, right. Uh, uh, well, then how do you explain the past um, teachings, uh, policies, and doctrines that are so hurtful and harmful and hateful? See, if, if you don't think that they've actually had that literal connection to God, then you can just assume that they're being led over time by God. They're doing the best they can and so on. But if you literally believe they have that literal connection where they see Jesus Christ that frequently and so on, then that really does put all the blame onto God. And then that makes God into a being that is essentially impossible to worship or does not deserve an ethical, reasonable person's adoration. Yeah, I got a feeling those aren't issues that are foremost in Elder Cook's mind. <laughs> but I hear what you're saying, and those are good points, I think. Well, for me, that has been something because it, it helped me feel comfortable earlier on realizing they, they have not seen Jesus Christ. The rep, they, they also, like Paul said, they also see through a glass darkly. And he was an apostle, right? And so if, if I could understand that, then I could make room for why God is not the evil one, why th these are mistakes in imperfections of men. But when, when the veil is so thin and the communication is this clear, there's no excuse. It's all God's fault. And now that's somebody that makes it difficult, uh, a, 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 that casts a God in an image that is difficult to worship. And I hear what you're saying, but I think that Elder uh, Cook is using this as a means uh, not of I don't think that's what he's thinking about. I think what he's okay, thinking he's about not. is this is my apostolic witness. I'm going to suggest to you that I've seen Jesus because I want you to believe it, even though it's not true. 
in a way to cement his authority and his position in the church. That's right. the feeling I get. I a hundred percent agree. And, and, and I'm saying, and I'm saying um, you're going to, you split the room. Half of the people, I'm just making these numbers up. Half the people are going to be more committed to the church and more committed to him because he has seen Christ. The other half are going to fall away because they're like, wow, if you've seen Christ and you're having this, this literal uh, communication with him, and yet we're making all these mistakes, then that ends up being a God that I don't want to worship. Right. And of course, we're not allowed to ask the natural follow up. So right. what do you say? Right. I thought the natural follow up was what other people have been asking in the chat, which is what color is his skin, which I, I just thought was funny. Well, I think we all know the yeah. answer to that. Right. Regardless of what it may have been in mortality, folks, it's white now. There you go. Did we read this last one leading into the first yeah. vision? Okay. Okay. And I forget who's Bednar now. Is it me? Why don't we make it you? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so Bednar starts right off. There are four accounts, and they don't contradict each other when you recognize the context and the fact that he was 14 years old. I mean, he was 14. Think about what you were doing when you were 14. Or talk to another 14-year-old. We should be surprised that he wrote anything down. <laughs> yes, we are lucky to have what we do have. I mean, the critic will look at the 1832 account and say that, see, Joe Smith is lying because here it says he only saw one bee, not two, which is what his later accounts claim. But either way, he obviously had a powerful ex spiritual experience and per perhaps he didn't understand what he saw at the time. After the first vision, his mother noticed he was different and asked him if he was okay, to which he said, I am well enough off. I have learned for myself. And that is the key. He learned for himself. We all have to learn for ourselves. I was going to say, but just don't focus too much on it. Right. Uh, all right. Yes, and perhaps at the time, Joel Smith didn't fully understand the significance of this vision. In fact, it is interesting because his accounting of the first vision lines up with it with his theological teachings at the time you're example, killing me tyler you're absolutely killing me with all the stuff you're laying on the bed nar <laughs> uh yeah for, for example in lecture of lecture uh five of lectures on faith joe smith taught that there are two beings in the godhead god the father who is a spirit and god the son who is god in the flesh so here there was no response, but there was interest and perhaps maybe even a confused look. And it just seemed like he had not heard that teaching before or he wasn't familiar with it or something. And so I, I went to another example. What that, what that look on his face actually means is, do I think I can strangle this guy right now and get away with it? <laughs> so, so then I said, uh, or like as another example, the 1829 edition of the Book of Mormon it says that God the Father was the one who was born of the Virgin Mary, which may reflect Joseph Smith's earlier beliefs and views of the time. So in 1832, it makes sense why he interpreted his earlier visionary or spiritual experience in a way that corresponds with his early theological understanding. So he, he made some comment to illustrate his maybe his disbelief about such a, a, a significant change in the Book of Mormon. Like that was the first time he heard that. So here we have back to back. You know, it was he, he's like, wow, he, he doesn't know about these things, you know. Um, so so I said, uh, yeah, I mean, we can look at the early uh, edition of the Book of Mormon online because, again, I brought this up because he's like looking at me like, wait, what are you talking about? Um, as we look at the early edition of the Book of oh, Mormon. Oh, by online, the way, I just want to say this is like all in the Joseph Smith papers and yeah. all these other documents that the church is publishing and that the apostles regularly appear and talk about reading them. Or maybe they haven't read them yet. But they all have copies, hardbound copies of all of them on their desks. Yeah, yeah, these are the ones, and and they're online too. Uh, and I say, yeah, the the uh, the Book of Mormon online to see what was originally written. Um, but my point is just that perhaps Joe Smith, well, since memory is an active reconstruction of events as opposed to a passive recollection, especially with spiritual experiences, then later in the 1840s, when his theology of the God had progressed, his interpretation of his earlier spiritual experiences also changed to conform to his theology. I know that when I recall spiritual experiences, I find myself finding more and or different meanings to them and even different truths as I am at a different stage of life with different theological understandings. I think, is it RFM? 
Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay, so uh, Elder Bednar says, yes, spiritual experiences can have many interpretations that are not limited by time or something. He said something like that. Right. Now, I will say I, I have never had a problem and continue to not have a problem today to Joseph Smith adding language to his revelations. Okay, in subsequent editions, I don't see that as a problem. I mean, there's one exception, like with Section 27, but we don't have to get into that. However, I do think it's a problem where a person ends up changing what is a purported historical event that actually happened to them and that they were a witness to. And if that changes over time, especially like you laid out to, to match their developing theology, I think that's problematic. What do you think, Maven? I um, I don't have a comment going off of that, but I disappeared for a second just in this where I came up back to first visions when he says like we should be surprised that he wrote anything down uh, at 14. And uh, I don't even have like my first journal here, but I've got three of them. These were all like written when I was a teenager and this one was when I was 14. So it's not that hard to write, especially I can guarantee you that everything in here is a lot more mundane than a first vision. Well, we're lucky to have those three journals of yours, Maven. <laughs> well, they're not going to um, feature any uh, anytime soon. You know, on on a special episode like the hundredth episode, maybe we should read selections from your journals as a oh, teenager. Oh, maybe. Actually, I bet I could find some pretty cringy stuff. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we, besides the T-shirt contest, um, do we? I, I don't know that we've actually planned it. So I don't know. Maybe we might be open to uh, ideas from the audience and suggestions. And um, I mean, it would be ultimately up to Bill and RFM. But um, and I did go ahead and put the email there, too, by the way, uh, for anyone who wants to submit a T-shirt design. Sorry, that's my aside. We can go back to this. Script. Well, and to push back on that just a, a little bit, maybe. Sure. Uh, because, you know, again, we could say, though, that Joseph Smith, he wasn't a writer. I mean, he he, he often had scribes to write things. He, he was a dictator. This was a young time. And so we could have something that, well, yeah, of course, he didn't write it down because he didn't write anything down. I'm he sorry, did write. you just say Joseph Smith was a dictator? More, <laughs> more of a, uh, yeah, I guess not not in that it, sense. but No, was, in that sense, too, maybe. Right. Patient. I mean, <laughs> yeah. But 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 it is interesting what his 1832 account. I mean that if, if you read that, it's pretty impressive language. So he was uh, he's he obviously learned some pretty good you know writing skills or something at at a time. But 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 I'm just I'm just saying trying to find you know give let's give brother Joseph a break, shall we? Uh, okay. If Bill was here, he would have the clip to play for that. <laughs> um yeah. All right, should we go on to plural marriage? Yeah, so he didn't seem to understand the Book of Mormon stuff. And so, I, again, he's still uncomfortable with that. So I just, I quickly moved on with his spiritual experience and stuff. And then I said, oh, RFI. You're muted. I wish you wouldn't say that because then people are going to want that T-shirt. We have a T-shirt that's been submitted with that as a proposed design, which I did not find amusing at all, I must say. We are going to have to really start booking through this. We're already much later than we normally would be. And I'm not sure. Maybe we should see what the audience reaction is to this and see about bringing you back for part two, Tyler. Is that OK by you? Yeah, we could do part two. I mean, I think some of that is spiritual epistemology is, you know, it is powerful to, to his, get his response on that. We are almost done. There's still but... quite a bit left. And that's what I was scrolling through yeah. when I was muted. So you wouldn't hear the scroll and then you didn't hear my voice because I was muted. So I, I do want to get through, but um, I just think that what with the, the hour and the amount of material to get through yet, um, can we just postpone this to a yeah. part two, Tyler? I apologize. I think everything that we've talked about has been fascinating and I don't want to give short shrift to the rest of it because that's my first impulse. Oh, let's just rip through the rest of it. But I don't think that's fair. You did that all the time teaching in Sunday school, you know, got to get through the lesson. <laughs> oh, I never did that because I never had a point I was trying to make. I should say, as I developed more as a teacher, I came to stop trying to get through everything because that was not a good idea. Right. No, I am fine. We we could finish this later because I do, I, I do think some of this other areas of this spiritual epistemology is an important um, discussion to have. 
I do too. And I know that there's going to be people who want to call and talk to you and ask you some questions. And we usually have we two, three to do calls. Yes. Can we do okay. that? Does everybody know the number by heart now? It has a bunch of sixes in it and some sevens. It is right here. Okay. And well, actually I need to get uh, logged in real quick. And a two, apparently the number is 662-667-6667. That's 662-667-6667. Call now. Operators are standing by. <laughs> now, Maven's telling us, wait a second, because apparently she has someone on the phone. No, she doesn't have anybody on the phone, but she's still telling me to wait a second. I need to call in, so I'm muting myself so you don't hear the phone call Oh, as I'm calling into the line. Sorry. Oh, I had no idea that you had to call into the line in order to get a phone call on the, the thing. By the way, Tyler... You look like you're in really, really good shape. What do you do for a workout? <laughs> uh, well, you know, I, I've, uh, I, I've always lifted weights, but recently I've got myself into arm wrestling. So, oh yeah, yeah, that's kind of been my new, my new sport. Um, I've, I've just really enjoyed it. Yeah. Is your favorite movie Over the Top with Sylvester Stallone? I just had, I just watched that. I, you know, a few months ago, I heard about it. It was, it was. Uh, a little different experience than what I'm used to, you know, but, um, yeah, I, but I've, I've competed. I actually competed in the world championship, um, for, for arm wrestling. Where was uh, that held? That was in Florida last, last uh, year. Um, it's an I IFA. I competed 138 pounds. So I, I uh, anyway, it's another story. We can well, go how'd with. you do? Well, I, well, uh, in this, in this, or there's several organizations, but in this one, I took fourth place with my left and fifth with my right. So, not not too bad, but no, not too bad at all. That's incredible. Congratulations. Thank you. Are you left-handed? I'm not, but I think my my right and left are closer than other people's, and and so maybe that's why. Well, one day I want to see you arm wrestle Maven. That's all I can say. <laughs> I, I don't want to lose on camera. <laughs> Maven, uh, do we have someone on the line? We do have someone on the line. Is it Elder Bednar? Yeah, I Is it Susan? <laughs> I really hope this works because I did test this out beforehand. So, hello, caller. Hopefully, hello? you're on the air and everyone can hear you. You hear? Yes. Okay. Hello. Success. Okay. Can Hi. you introduce yourself uh, first and then we'll go ahead and go for um, it? Uh, well, my name's Thomas. And I, I tried calling in last week and I had a, a thought or question regarding last week. Uh, 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 discussion with the uh the occult and such and i remember listening to uh bryce viking eagles naked mormonism and he he had made mention of some of the money changing and horse trading or such that as they would be trying to pass whatever the items were from group to group the in the occult would have their you know, handshakes that helped them indicate or know that you were part of the group and could be trusted. And I've, and it, it seemed to make sense to me in, in the way he explained it, that that also could um, be a background for why some of the witnesses or early members of the church, while they may have left the church or been excommunicated, later never denied either the Book of Mormon or parts of their testimony or things that happened while they had disagreements with Joe, they didn't deny X, Y, or Z. And it seemed to fit that there was that occult background that they had made these, these oaths that may or may not have later kind of um, became parts of like the temple penalties and such, but that there were earlier penalties and oaths that caused them to hold true to certain aspects because they had made certain oaths on that. Do you feel that there's any validity to that? I guess is my question. What do you think, Maven? I mean, it's, it's possible. And I have no, have I have no idea it. myself. Maybe Dan, do you have any insight into this Tyler? Cause I've never heard of this before. I just know the covenants that we made in the temple and what they used to make. And so there's certainly a plausibility for all of that, right? But I, I have not 
heard of those types of, you know, if that truly taking place. But it's also kind of an unspoken rule in, in a lot of ways, right? I mean, even as a magician, I mean, you don't literally take an oath, but you, you know, you know that you kind of have an oath. Yeah, and there's no way you're going to get out of me how I did that thumb trick. Just so you know, don't even try. I just want to say I, I feel um, no compunction about any of my temple covenants. Um, about about I don't think I'm actually really breaking all that many, but um, but not on purpose. They they don't mean anything to me. So I I maybe that was something that mattered back then, but I, I just know I don't feel that way. And maybe Dan Vogel can call in if he has any information on that. And I'll keep an eye on the chat too. Um, thank you, Connor. I'm sorry. Yeah, that thanks, Thomas. Was, sorry uh, that uh, oh, we weren't able. I'm sorry. I was say, say thanks, Thomas. Sorry we weren't we were not able to get you in last week when uh, we had some technical no worries, difficulties. No worries. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks Thomas. Thomas. We've got two more callers, um, so I'll go ahead and take uh, take the next one. I think I might know who this one is. Um, let's see. First name, David. Hello, caller. You are online. Hi, David. Online. This is David. Oh. I knew Hi, it. David uh, from up in Idaho. I just had a question for uh, Tyler. As you're speaking with uh, Elder Bednar face-to-face, -face, what was your sense? Uh, did you feel like he's being evasive? Uh, did you feel like you were getting lawyer speak from him? Uh, you know, or did you feel like, hey, this is a guy bearing his testimony to you and he's very, very genuine? Because so often we can see in their face and their body language what really is, is being said. So I just wanted to get your opinion on that. Yeah, a great, great question, David. Um, you know, first off, I think he wanted to know the angle I was coming from. I think that was important for him. I think he wanted to know if I was um, just an, a, a, a strong fan of his that just wanted to, you know, be at his feet. Or if maybe I was, a, you know, an apostate of some sort or had some angst with the church. Um, so I, I think he was reserved trying to trying to get a feel for, for, for those types of things. Um, and, and then some of the specific questions, um, absolutely the lawyer type uh, feelings the language came out, um, as we kind of see, you know, and dodging certain specific questions. I think they probably those things they've had discussions with because they don't want to give you know, an, an opinion that's not official, for example. Um, however, all in all, I felt that what he, um, that, that he is a sincere believer, that he, what he was trying to generally say um, what he feels and what he believes. And I, I don't feel like he was trying to just totally give me the runaround, except the areas where he knew he needed to. Other than that, I felt like he was trying to be sincere. And I think Anthony So at the, at the end of the day, I was just saying, Ed, so at the end of the day, did you, you know, terrible. if you're listening to it. I'm so sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, at the end of the day, did you feel like you'd actually listen to a prophet's voice and and were hearing the word of God? Or did you feel like uh, somebody who is just trying to gauge his audience and, and, and just give an easiest answer he possibly could? Uh, no, I, I, I felt that I was, I felt that, um, like I said in the beginning, I felt the fruits of the spirit, you know, and many times throughout the conversation. And, and, and I, I feel, I feel there was a, a presence and a sense about that, that um, was really faith promoting in, in, in that way. I mean, there was, there, there's something about just being a presence, but we talked about this reverence um, that I've had for him for a long time, being on my mission. I feel like, and part of it was his sincerity um, of just listening to my questions and different things. So I, I don't feel that he was, you know, standoffish and just, just kind of, you know, faking it or anything like that. There was, there was certainly sincerity as, as we talked. Um, I, I'm not sure if that answers the question. Uh, David, are you still there? No? Yeah, I am. Okay. I just, the one thing I want you to remember yeah. from your call in is that I knew your name before you identified yourself. A true prophet. <laughs> well, I have a witness of that out of him. Thank you. It's and recorded now. You. Everybody can know it. Everybody can see it. Thanks, David. Thank you so much. Um, we just have one more, and I think this will be good from there. Um, I think so. I think. Uh, I think. All right, Collar, you're on the line. 
Hi, um, I just had a quick question, and it, I didn't get a chance to listen to the full um, podcast today because I was out. But this is a question that my name's Crystal. Sorry. Hi, Crystal. And my question is, it's kind of off. I love all of you so much, and I just appreciate what you do. And it's a little off subject, so if you can't answer it, then I totally get it. But when I went to Crestage Jail when I was younger, I what did remember you do? telling me that everybody. Crystal? Well, I went to Crestage Jail. Uh huh. What yeah. did you do? What did I do? Yeah, that you had to go to Carthage Jail. It's a look. It's the defense attorney oh. humor oh, hour. No. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, sorry. I thought you meant tonight. Sorry, I went to Kate night, so I might be a little bit tipsy. But well, um, wait a second. What did you do to oh, Crystal? To tell us. I remember. <laughs> I, go ahead. No, Crystal, I did not go to Carthage Jail. I went. I went there as a visitor. <laughs> oh, okay. On a family vacation. And um, I remember feeling like the spirit really strong, which now I understand that's kind of how it's programmed, to be, you know, because that's what you learn. And Joseph Smith was, I don't believe in the church anymore, but I have a really hard time with Joseph Smith because you're taught that he's such this amazing man, you know, your whole life. I grew up in the church and you kind of revere him over everybody. And they told us that this, like when you go through the tour, that everybody that killed Joseph Smith died a horrible death. Like they had proof. And I didn't know if you guys had any clue about that at all. I guess Maven that has a huge that clue like about that. Really Crystal. Kind of... um, Sorry, what was that? Maven has a huge clue about that. The only thing I know about the Carthage oh, jail is well, that there's no basement there. Um, yeah. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to, so I'm, well, yeah. Um, so there's actually a book out. Um, it's not one of the most common and most popular ones, um, but it is called The Fate of the Persecutors of Joseph Smith. And it's uh, it was uh-huh. it's a compilation of stories. Uh, so the compiler is a man by, uh, named it, just N. B. Lundwall, and I don't actually know much about him. Other, I just know that this was compiled. These stories were compiled at the end of the 1940s into the early 1950s. And so it's not. So it's it's just affidavit after affidavit from people saying this is the story, and I swear to it. And sometimes there's a second person, uh, basically serving as a mm-hmm. witness that the first is correct. However. Um, I guess I, maybe to shorten it, and I, I might have more to say on this in the future, um, but I guess I would say that the um, uh, the stories told about persecutors of Joseph Smith and how their lives ended uh, may have been greatly exaggerated and have a lot of okay, elements that's... of folklore to them. Um, but I, I say this, and the reason why yeah. I, RFM, I was actually just talking about this book earlier, this was actually a big part when I was a teenager, I read this book, although actually, ironically, the whole most of the book is affidavits about the restoration and about Joseph Smith. So it's really only like the very last chapter of that book that you actually get to the good stuff. So if anybody's looking for the book, skip the first 90 percent and then just go for that last chapter. But um, I had read these <laughs> and they're really horrific stories. And I just again, I just believed it outright. And this was also a part of yeah, my definitely. testimony for Joseph Smith. And so um yeah, so this this book yeah. really had a big impact on me because I thought these stories were true, and so um, hopefully, I'm, I hope I'm not like jinxing it by giving it away ahead of time. I'm I'm hoping to talk about the book more <laughs> and the more details about this um, on Stephen oh, Pinecker's awesome. podcast on Mormon book reviews. So that it's still kind of in the works. So I'm still actually doing a little bit of of, of background research and we're just kind of like get schedules together. So that's coming up in the future. But hopefully, I answered it enough. Oh, yeah. awesome. Because I totally agree. Like, it was really a testimony builder. Like, oh, my gosh, these men were, like, kind of punished, basically, for what they had done. And so it's hard to get my mind around that, even though, like, I have huge issues with polygamy. Like, that's kind of the biggest thing that kind of took me out of the church. And so as I was just trying to wrap my head around that. And so I really appreciate uh, you answering that. And once again, Maven, I just think you're awesome. And RFM, I just... I think you're amazing and tell Bill real high next week. Oh, I will. Crystal, so Crystal, before you go, can I ask you a question? Uh-huh. Okay. And I apologize for all my interruptions. I'm getting a little tipsy myself at this point in the evening, but did it ever occur to you? <laughs> did it ever occur to you when you were listening to those stories that, geez, if God had just done that, 
you know, a little bit earlier, then maybe Joseph Smith wouldn't have died. Well, yeah, but that's the problem, right? You don't, they train you not to think, past, oh, well, this is just the truth, right? This is amazing and beautiful, this amazing story. And then you start hearing the nitty gritty of it. And it's like, oh, I feel like an idiot now because I didn't even put two and two together a lot of the time. You know? know, it's like June 27th, 1844 is totally God's nap time. And he's asleep. Dang it. Look what happens when I woke up. Joseph's dead. Hiram's dead. Okay, I'm really pissed off at these people who did it. I guess I would say maybe an apologetic answer is that, you know, the the whole agency thing. So we had to let uh, the uh, the persecutors have their agency to be evil and wicked so that they could deserve the punishment they're getting, whereas God punishing them after the fact yeah. is not affecting their agency. So there's there's my TBM hat for you. Well, right, and, um, no, and that's true. And I, I just remember like they, they didn't say anything about Joseph had a gun or anything so my mind was just blown like to find out that he actually had a gun and he fought back you know it's like they pick and choose they cherry pick what they're going to tell you to make you feel like your faith is going to improve and have this amazing experience and to be basically told it's all a lie you know it just it's a hard place to be in so I just really appreciate what you guys do and makes me feel like I'm not alone so thank you hey Crystal Crystal once again this is serious RFM talking Mm -hmm. okay you are not alone okay you are not insane. Thank you. You are normal. You are rational. And the problem that you're having right now is that you're starting to move into a rational position from an irrational position, which strangely is making you think that you're irrational when actually it's the opposite that's the case. And I appreciate that. I really do because I know, like I said, I was born into the church. You know, I'm the youngest of nine. And I never felt good enough. And I, I think a lot of that stemmed from my, from the church and because my parents felt like they were forced, like my parents are amazing, amazing people, but it's all the church, you know, that's just how their program. Like if your kids are not good, it's because the mom fails, it's the mom. And so it's kind of a big relief to realize that maybe I don't, just because my kids don't choose to serve a mission or live the church, they're still good kids, you know? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. You're very so welcome. You Thank you for calling in, Crystal. <laughs> yeah, and and keep. Yep, I appreciate it. Some of those stories are. Really I will. Great. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Crystal. Yeah. Can you say the name of that book again, real oh, quick? Yeah, it's called "The Fate of the Persecutors of Joseph Smith." So not. Okay. Super perfect. unoriginal. Yeah, but it, it's right there in the title. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's not too okay. hard to find. I think Benchmark Books has it. That's where I I got a new copy of it, and um. And this is one of the things you talked about feeling kind of silly or kind of stupid at, at some of the things and the feelings that you had. And this book was really one of it for me when I at, now as an adult, like at double the age that I was maybe a little bit more reading these stories and just seeing how just absolutely ridiculous they are. I felt the same way. Just it, it's kind yeah. of silly that I didn't see any problem with this when I was reading as a teenager. But, you know, what, what can you do? Yeah, yeah, it really makes you feel like an idiot. But I really appreciate it because you guys, you know, a lot of people have the same story where they kind of wake up. And and so I'm looking forward to the future. I am. And I just appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Thanks, You're welcome. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs> All right. Bye. Good night. Thanks, everyone, for staying so long with the call. <laughs> So, Tyler, we're going to say thank you to Tyler for coming. We're going to hope to have you back here very soon. Next week, we're planning on having Cheryl Bruno on the show to talk about her new book uh, about Mormonism and Masonry. It's called Method Infinite. And I'm at least halfway through that book, and I'm going to make it through the rest of it before next week. It's what a book. I'm learning lots of things in this book. Some I did not expect to, to learn, but it's really, really increasing my understanding, not just about masonry and mormonism but about mormonism period sounds exciting oh it'll be very and then exciting we'll be back and then i think i don't know will bill want a couple of turns i i just i really want tyler back soon and i, I hope it's not too too long so i do too so we'll stay in touch all right tyler yeah yeah we'll figure it out so. all right thank you so much for coming on and i'm sorry for uh having to cut it into two parts i apologize no there's a lot to cover and it's very interesting and i think that you know for for transparency purposes i think it's great to get it out there and like i said i sent it to many um strong members and it strengthens their faith and testimony which is 
which is great. Um, I think there's great things you can learn from it, and there's more to cover. Um, you know, he, he is an apostle, and and I think it's a great way, great way to get some insights into his perspectives and how he thinks about things. So I'm I'm happy to to share my experience with other Bednar. Thank you again very much, Maven. You've been great. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful having you on board. I saw that your picture was on the thumbnail. I think you look great. I was told to do that. I shouldn't say you? that. Who told you to do that? Who planned for me to do that? Who was so, crazy enough to do that? Or was, it, or was it you? I think it was you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that guys. explains it. <laughs> All right. <laughs>